Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Uh, um, hey, how are you? I'm starting to suspect that you are muting me yourself and then I, saying, RFM, you're muted. Is that what's maybe, going on now, Bill? Maybe. Has, has I, it come I to this? To get, I figure that you know so many quotes and sh- from Shakespeare and movies and music that I need to get one up on you. And so making you look silly at the beginning is my number one goal. Well, I don't need a lot of help to look silly, but we are getting started about eight minutes late tonight. I'm very excited about this because we're having technological issues and or technical issues. And I just want everybody to know it's not my fault tonight. It's not. We had a little bit of a technology snafu at the beginning, but everything seems to be running smooth now. And we're super excited to be with you. Um, I did want to put one thing up on the screen before we get started, RFM. What is uh, that? Just to let folks know here. Um, that this cool thing is going to happen. John DeLynn reached out to me a few weeks back, maybe even as much as a month ago, said that he was thinking about putting together uh, a special event where I would go up to Salt Lake City with my wife, Amanda, and sit down for a long Mormon Stories interview. And folks think, because I've been on Mormon Stories, I think four times at this point, uh, and really talking about my kind of life story and the journey of doing the podcast and, and exiting the church, but There are stories I haven't told. For instance, there's the night I spent in jail as a seven-year-old that I've never told uh, publicly. What on earth Um, could you have done as a seven-year-old that landed you in jail for the night? Yeah, you'll have to you'll have to show up that night for this uh, blockbuster conversation uh, with John Delin on Mormon Stories. At least tune in when we do the the conversation there, which I sure will be live and then published for folks to listen afterward. Maven saying it's murder. Uh, man, as a seven-year-old, I've never murdered anybody, but I'm not going to get into the details. It, it's a scary story. I'll bet uh, it. But I definitely do, lent... do murder and calm go together? Calm and murder? Murder? I don't know. I, I definitely landed as a seven-year-old. I landed at the uh, local uh, Who's police gal? station. And beyond that, they took me to the jail. And I did spend a little bit of time in a jail cell. Uh, jail cell as a seven-year-old. So so there are some fun stories still to tell about my life. I'm excited to do that. And then they're going to have a, a VIP dinner at 6 p.m. on May 30th. And then there'll be a short conversation on my end, uh, maybe Amanda's as well. And then we'll answer kind of Q&A with the audience that night. It's 30 bucks, I think, for the VIP dinner, $10 for the uh, uh, presentation and Q&A afterward at 7 and uh, John has said that, you know, outside of the cost, that the proceeds will be donated to Mormon Discussion Incorporated. And so, folks, you can deeply support the podcast entity um, by showing up for those events. And you can see the donor box address there. This is like two weeks away. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, I'll be there from Sunday evening through Wednesday early morning. Uh, so maybe even if folks uh, want to reach out, I might be able to kind of put maybe a lunch or something together, a breakfast together for folks who want to do that as well. So I'm really excited. And I'm really appreciative of uh, John and the Open Stories Foundation for putting this together. Yeah, he's a great guy. Who is that handsome young man in the bottom right corner of this thumbnail that's, you have up this slide? That's good old John DeLynn right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. It looks like he's about seven years old in that picture. Yeah, well, no, yeah. <laughs> well, there's that. So I'll pull that off the screen. Uh, anything else from you, uh, Mr. Radio Free Mormon? Did you just turn it over to me when I had my microphone out of my ear? I was just asking if there's anything else from you before we did turn it over to you. I think, well, let's just go because we got so much to cover tonight, but we're going to try and keep it in a reasonable amount of time. Now, by way of introduction, tonight's show is gone in 60 minutes. It's going to be our analysis of the 60 minutes interview that happened last Sunday on May 14th, 2023, about church finances and the SEC scandal and all that good stuff. But I just want you to know that 
I have come about with this outline in a circuitous way because I spent hours and hours and hours looking at all of the articles that had been written about this particular 60 Minutes piece on the church. And there, in addition to watching the 60 Minutes piece, of course. So there's a ton of stuff out there from both sides, right? There were two preemptive strikes on this from church apologists, one at Fair Mormon, who I think is now just Fair, but it's hard to keep track, but you know who they are, right? You used to work for them, Bill. Yeah, Fair, Fair LDS, Fair Mormon, maybe back to Fair LDS. I, I don't know. They Whatever the church does, they just get in line and, and tow it. Yeah, it's inspiring, yeah. really. Yeah. So there's one at Fair Mormon. There's one at Big Book of Mormon Central that was a preemptive article before the 60 Minutes piece aired. Of course, it was a few days before they knew it was coming. And then there was a piece in the Deseret News, which was almost preemptive. It was all written out, and then it was released within an hour or two of the 60 Minutes piece airing. So that was on the evening of May 14th. And then the following day, there was another Deseret News article. And I, it was, I can't remember which one of them. One of them was about as long as Moby Dick. It was so freaking long. It went through the whole church history of finances. Now, went through all that, highlighted it, annotated it, put all my comments in it. And then I'm thinking, how on earth can I organize this for a podcast? And last night, I'm having this problem because how do I get my arms around all this information and try and make sense of it for the audience? And I started realizing something. First off, the thing I realized is that all of these different apologetic excuses that are being trotted out there are really just distractions from the main issue. There are a number of different um, excuses that have been put out there, which we're not going to go into. I'm just going to tick them off here so you'll know that. And by tick them off, I mean go through the checklist. Um, so you'll know that I actually did read the articles. One is that the, the church has this wonderful rags to riches story. You know I'd go from rags to riches. The church used to be really, really poor. In fact, it almost had to declare bankruptcy on more than one occasion. But now it has lots of money, so that's a good thing. Okay, that's a distraction that has nothing to do with the issue. Another one I encountered was the presiding bishopric, all the members of the presiding bishopric, they have tons and tons of credentials and experience in investing money. So they're the right guys to handle the job. Well, that's a distraction too, because that has nothing to do with the issue. The third one was, if you divide up the estimated wealth of the church by 17 million members, it really isn't that much. I don't know if you saw that one. This is from the Thunder Down Under, the, the Australian guy who just got baptized like in March and all of a sudden he's an authority and doing podcasts in defense of the church. Mm -hmm. And he has all the zeal of a new convert, the kind that you and I used to have, Bill, before we... I remember up, those days. Smelled the Java, yeah. our eyes opened, that kind of stuff. You do remember those days. Yeah, two months after, I would have been doing those too. And I probably would have been just as zealous and just as wrong-headed as this fellow is. But yeah, God Give him two decades. Can I, can I jump that? in? Real quick. Yeah, guys. please. Hi, Maven. How are you doing? I, I, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I've okay. been better, but I've also been worse. So I just wanted to jump in real quick about the church finances and just say that Rebecca Biblioteca and Landon on Mormonish did a fantastic episode about early church finances and kind of basically how there's been fraud all the way. Um, that's Their podcast is Mormonish, and Landon did a ton of research on that, and I learned a lot of stuff that I I have not heard anywhere else. I just wanted to plug that really quick. Sweet. Bill's I was going to say, sorry, that was a bit of an anyway. ceremonious oh, leaving. Back. But <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I was done talking, and so I just thought I would leave. But then I just realized I really left it open there. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's it. Love you guys, and I'll I'll pop up maybe. <laughs> see okay, see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for plugging a different show than ours, Maven. Anyway, <laughs> I... <laughs> Yeah, right. she'll, she'll be popping in and out, you know, as the spirit moves her. But th that was three of the different um, excuses slash reasons that have been uh, trotted out in order to sort of justify things. And the fourth one was the church is not a democracy. The church is a kingdom, a literal kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so, you know, democracies, they like transparency. Kingdoms, not so much. So it's okay for the church not to be transparent because it's a kingdom, not a democracy, see? That also is a distraction. It has nothing to do with the issue here. And it struck me after doing all this research and reading all of these arguments 
and figuring it out how to respond to them, that this is a distraction. These are all distractions away from the real issue. And what we're going to do tonight is try not to get caught up in these distractions because the extent to which we at Mormonism Live or RFM or Bill or Maven, to the extent that we go chasing down these distractions is the extent to which the apologists win because they're succeeding in taking our eye off the ball. And we're allowing ourselves to be distracted by their distractions. So what we're going to focus on tonight, as best we can, is on the real issue tonight, which mainly is this, what it was that the church official representative that was trotted forth, I guess he drew the short straw, first counselor in the presiding bishopric, Christopher Waddell, actually said in the 60 Minutes report, all right? So that's what we're going to do. And I did want to mention this too, because this is exciting stuff. The Widows Might Report just released today, actually less than eight hours ago today, their official response to the 60 Minutes interview and specifically to what it was that Bishop Waddell was captured saying on the record. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight with the help of the Widow's Might. So we've got slides from the Widow's Might. We also have some clips from the 60 Minutes report. And we're going to play all that. And to help us get through this and analyze it correctly, we are happy to announce that we have a special guest on tonight's show. It is a professor of accounting from the University of Illinois. His name is Spencer Anderson. Can we bring him on? Bill, and I hope I didn't yes. say that too quickly. Spencer Anderson. Hey, Professor Anderson. Ooh. You're, you, you yeah, tell ooh. him, Bill. There we go. Try it again. Okay. Can you hear me Can again? you hear us? Yeah. We are rocking I was the technical down. issues, if you couldn't tell. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah. No, no, no. no my no heart biggie. almost stopped. All right. So I'm so glad that you're with us tonight. Um, can you tell us? Well, I tell you what. Let me just tell you, okay? Because I prepared for this and I didn't prepare you for this question. I want to just mention who who the Widow's Might is, all right? The Widow's Might is not just one person. What the Widow's Might is, is a consortium of experienced and trained investment professionals who have taken all the information the church has released about its finances over the years and connected the dots to come very close to a kind of ballpark figure approximations and very good and pretty narrow and pretty close approximations of how much the church makes, how much it has, and how much it spends, and where. They've released a number of reports since last year, I believe, and maybe even two years now. But the most recent report, as I said, is on the 60 Minutes interview. And we even have rumor through, I think, creditable sources, though I can't tell you what they are, that top church leadership is aware of and is reading and has read the Widow's Might reports, and there's a certain grudging respect among them for the people who have put it together. About that little bit, I can't say any more. Does that about cover the description of the Widow's Might, do you think, or do you want to add anything, Spencer? Yeah, that's right. Um, and I can also verify what you said about the senior church officials knowing about Widow's Might and begrudgingly respecting them. This is great. I mean, I love it because they could provide all this information. The widows might wouldn't even exist if they would just provide the information. That's the whole thing. If the church really were transparent, weird. there would be no point in having the widows might because the widows might is there to try and help the church be transparent or to right. show what it is that they're hiding. And yeah. if anything came across loud and clear from Bishop Waddell's interview on 60 Minutes, it's that they're hiding, they're not going to tell, and they got no plans to tell anytime soon about how much they have. Mm -hmm. That's right. In fact, I think that it's okay for me to say, because I did talk to, you know, the kingpin of Widow's Might this afternoon, and the 60 Minutes crew actually used and relied pretty extensively upon the Widow's Might reports in preparing for their interview with... Bishop Waddell. I'll just call him Bishop Waddell. I know he's the first counselor, but that gets kind of long. Um, so by that, I mean that they not just they didn't just rely on it and take it at face value. They 
enlisted their own experts, their own financial experts to review it. And it definitely looked solid. And so they went with it. And this is how extensive and how significant the Widow's Might reports are. And I want to get that out there in bold face and highlighted and underlined before we start looking at what it is they say in response to the 60 Minutes piece. That's right. Yeah. So the 60 Minutes producer, so he he contacted me as well. We talked for hours on the phone and as well with Widows My People. And the primary source of information for the podcast or for the episode, sorry, was um, was obviously David Niels's allegations. But in order to verify or support that, it all was from Widow's Might. The primary source was from Widow's Might in order to support it. Right, right. So, all right, well, let's go, if it's okay, let's go to the Widow's Might report. It is about 26 pages or so. We're gonna go through it with some alacrity. And uh, when we have that up here, then we'll go ahead and start reading through it. So are we talking this here? We are talking this here. Okay. Uh, I love it. So this is page one. Observations and clarifications on 60 Minutes, The Church is Firm. That was the name of the piece that they did. And they've got 11 topics, and they have them listed there. And instead of just reading them, we'll go through them now, starting with page two. Is that okay? Yeah. What so, was your, just before we get started, I was just wondering, what's, what was your were your overall impressions of the episode? Did you like Bill, did you, you like wanna, the episode? Yeah. I, I, can, I can answer that, but Bill, you go first, please. So I would say I was underwhelmed. Not because I, I already knew the church had all this money and I already knew they were hiding it. I it almost seemed to me as though the SEC report came after they had already decided this was going to be their subject and after they had already delved deeply and and already prepared or went into covering it the way they did. Because it seemed like a huge uh, absence of something that was missing being the SEC report and the line of questioning about how egregious the ethics of the top church leadership was. Uh, I, I almost felt like somehow the church got lucky and got in the way of the first half of what they wanted to cover. And then the SEC thing came out and uh, 60 Minutes had already done their thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it, make, it makes it end up being so complicated. The complications of this uh, scheme that the church was involved in plays in its favor because it's hard to understand unless you take a lot of hours, especially if you're a lay person like me and don't understand this kind of stuff naturally. It's not my field of practice. It takes hours and hours it has taken me to try and piece this together, figure it out, get a handle on it, talking with people like Spencer who can help me understand these things. But this is a 13 minute piece, a little bit more than 13 minutes. They are not going to be able to talk to people like Spencer or you, Bill, or me or Maven or pretty much most of the people in the audience who already know 10 times more than what they had time to get into. So they're playing it to a person who doesn't know anything about any of these issues and has to try and build it from the bottom up in 13 minutes, get everything in they can and try and be fair to both sides right? It's not supposed to be a hit piece. It's supposed to be a news piece. I think they did a really good job. And I will say a couple of other things. One is that first off, David Nielsen, I thought did a very good job. Yeah. It was very cl uh, clear that the, the piece was slanted by 60 minutes. Anyway, it's slanted against the church and it's in favor of the whistleblower. It's against Goliath and it's in favor of David. And the reason I say that is because I think that David got off easy uh, as far as the questioning went, at least the, the questions that were that were put on screen. And those sneakies at 60 Minutes in their promo had that piece where um, Bishop Waddell is talking about, you know, uh, it's confidential, right? It's not secret, it's confidential. And then the reporter says, what's the difference? And then they edited it in the promo. The promo is different than the way it played. They edited it to make it look like Okay. And that's not what really happened. And when I actually saw what really happened, it didn't look anywhere near as bad. Obviously, there was a bit of a pause, but he picked it right up. I have heard that there's someone out there, maybe multiple people, somebody with the last name Brunson, is it Sam Brunson or something like that, who was just really criticizing 
Bishop Waddell for his performance, saying there was a lack of preparation, it was terrible. I disagree with that. I think that Waddell did an incredibly good job. And it's possible to focus on his like two second pause before answering this question and overlook the fact that he is in a minefield and he has to navigate this as very best as he can without blowing himself up. He had multiple opportunities to blow himself up and believe me, they're looking to blow him up. He managed to make it through alive. And that was amazing. And I think that's success. Also, he never lost his composure. If he had lost his composure, that would have been bad. But he always managed to seem affable. He has sort of a, you know, kind of the general authority, kind of the soft, affected voice. But it worked. It was gentle. And it wasn't aggressive. And he responded with words, even if they weren't necessarily actually answers to the questions that were asked. What did you think about it, Spencer? Um, I agree with you a lot, RFM. I think that, you know, it was for a generalized audience. And so it wasn't for our eyes as much. So in 13 minutes, they had to cover a lot. And the producer said something afterwards, like this is as deep as we were willing to go um, for a general audience. But he felt like he was drinking out of a fire hose for months trying to learn all this stuff. And, you know, because we talked about FBA, FBAR violations that didn't even get brought up with the IRS, some of the other David Nielsen accusations that had been made. When it came to Bishop Waddell, I think I agree with you, RFM, a little bit. I don't think we should go too hard on him as a person. He was thrown out there to defend the indefensible, essentially. Mm -hmm. And in that role as a fall guy, in in some sense, he I think he delivered in a great way. Like he gave some nice sound bites mm -hmm. for us. <laughs> <laughs> he provided some entertainment value in, for the general audience, given his like, you know, a uh, few snafus and him not being able to understand what synonyms are. You know, there were a few times that he did that. He said, not only is David Nielsen incorrect, he's flat out wrong. Those are they mean the same thing. He also said um, wrong and sounds confidential, like an attorney or, or sorry, secret and confidential are not the same thing. Right. He, uh, yes, there are just a few instances of that. So lightheartedly, I thank him. Honestly, I think I think that it was a much better episode with him on. Uh, yes. Imagine if it was just David Nielsen's accusations with no response whatsoever. And so we got to see the non-response from the church. And I think you're right. Also, the episode was going to go forward with David Nielsen, with or without the church. The producer didn't think they were going to get the church as at, at some point um, in the middle of these negotiations. They reached out. They weren't sure if the church was going to respond. And it was going to go forward either way. So, you know, I have some Catholic friends and they watched it and they seemed to get a kick out of his remarks. Like that was the best part of the episode. And mm -hmm. so in that respect, I think uh, he delivered. He helped us all feel uh, like it was not too boring and and provided some drama. Mm -hmm. So I like that part of it. Obviously, I think the bottom line of what he said was, responses. yeah, his bottom line message that I got was we have got a ton of money in the church right. and we're not going to tell you how much even though you've guessed and even though you're probably somewhere in the right neighborhood <laughs> we're still not going to tell you because our reasoning is and those reasons will also hold up if we told you the same kind of thing would happen but we're just not going to tell you <laughs> that oh, summarizes yeah. we'll the whole thing that. yeah we will get to that so tonight's show we're going to be focusing on our good friend uh, Bishop Waddell, looking at what he said, because he's the only person here who actually speaks as a representative of the church in this episode. So if, if we can now go back to where we were before with that first, we had the first slide up and now we have the second slide up, right? And the second slide, let me go ahead and explain this to everybody who's watching. This is the second slide in the uh, Widow's Might Report. So topic one, total investment assets. And here we have a clip from the show that is written out and quoted on this slide. All right. And what we're going to try and do now, if everything works out okay and keep your fingers crossed at home, we're going to try and play the clip from the show that matches this quote from The Widow's Might. Religious organizations don't have to fully disclose all financial information to the IRS. What is the value right now of 
Sign peaks to acids. Yeah, that's something I can't I can't share with you right now. I know there've been there've been reports on on approximates and that kind of thing, and and that's as far as we can go right it's now. It's been estimated at 150 billion dollars. Does that sound correct? Um, I, that's an estimate uh, that some have made. Are we in the ballpark or no? Um, we have significant resources. Okay. Boom. All right. So if we go to the widow's mite, first off, yeah, they have okay, kind of a, yeah. they they usually don't get cute at all. This is not a cute report. It's very very factually based. It's very down the middle. It's very even and dispassionate. But here they had to say this much. Response from the widow's mite report to that clip is, "Thank you for the acknowledgement of our research and analysis. We have worked diligently to go as far as we can go with the available data and information." Now, what does that mean, Spencer? Why is the widow's mite taking credit for what happened there on the interview? I mean, people internal to the church know about widow's mite report. This is what they're referring to the widow's mite report here. And I think you can infer from his response here that the real number is around the ballpark that that Sharon offered, right? If it was like, let's say that Sharon had offered some outlandish number like a a trillion dollars, I don't think he would have said um, we have sufficient for our needs or whatever he said. I think that he would have said, no, it's not that high. That's absurd. And By so the, way, the fact that $150 billion wasn't immediately critiqued means that we are in the ballpark. And just as a clarification, the most recent Widow's My Report estimate would be around $175 billion not mm-hmm. 150 billion right now for Ensign Peak, just given the last few months of the stock market. And so it's, uh, you know, it's possible that it's a lot more than that. And I think some people inferred that from the, from the, um, from his response, right? He kind of smiled as he said, yeah, we have a lot of resources. I would love to just collect the compounded interest on a savings account or CD on that money. But another, th- by the way, I think the same thing you just said, but dealing with, the lower number if they had said a trillion you said they would have said no we don't have that much so when he says when she says 150 billion if that number was too high he would have answered no we don't have that much the fact that he doesn't want to tell us and the way he said it indicates to me that widow's might is right there's actually more in there than 150 billion because the only reason to give the answer he did was that the number is actually higher and he would actually prefer the audience to be left with the idea of 150 billion. I think there's maybe some truth in that bill. From my point of view, if I'm prepping him as a witness and I'm sure he got prepped up the yin yang for this, I would tell him, you don't play that game. You just don't say anything. You don't say yay, nay, or anything about any number that's put out there. Because as soon as you do that, you've committed yourself now to the game. And then they can start saying, oh, it's not that much, so it's less. Well, is it this much less? And is it more than this? And is it bigger than a bread box? I think he played it right, actually. I'm pretty sure it's 179 billion. It's right around there. But 150 billion, it's definitely that much that they have. They have more than that. 150 billion is conservative. He didn't blow up, but that's just my take on his response. That's how I would have prepared him. I would have said, don't engage. Just say, I can't tell you that right now. Of course, he says right now, and he says it with a nice disarming smile. Later on, he'll say, yeah, I'm not telling you this right now, and I'm never going to tell you. Yeah, right. So do we have a next slide on this? Okay, next slide. Uh, This is another clip now from the Widow's Might Report between the reporter Sharon Alfonsi and Christopher Waddell. Okay, and you want the next video? Yes, please. Okay. Percentage is going out the door Mm -hmm. of the money under management. Mm -hmm. To be honest, we've we've never looked at it as a percentage. We looked at it based on needs to make sure that we're comfortable with how many years worth we have in case of of financial difficulties, in case of financial crisis, to make sure that we can continue church operations, we just want to make sure that 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 is sufficient. Okay, first thing I got to say, that's total BS. 
<laughs> okay, that's total BS. There's nobody in investment or accounting that. who doesn't look at everything in the entire world in terms of percentages. I've got a friend of mine who's a personal injury lawyer. He says, I can't do a lot of math, but one thing I can do, you can tell me any number and I can tell you what a third of it is. Because that's what he does, right? That's his contingency fee. So he can take any number regardless of odd, even, how big it is, how small it is, how strange, and how many numbers it has, and he'll come right up with what a third of it is. In the same way, this individual, I am positive, thinks in terms of percentages. You can't think in terms of the future and how much you need without thinking in percentages. Uh, am I off base on this, Spencer? You're the professor of accounting. Oh, well, geez, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of obvious, right? So like, first of all, it's a really easy answer to give because the percentage is zero in terms of what's going out. That's the whole allegation. And of course, right. he's avoiding that. Mm. But let's say that, you know, let's just take him at his word. And let's say that you are trying to figure out how many years worth you have in case of financial difficulties. Well, how do you do that? You calculate a percentage. You say, well, what's my, how much do I have? And that's on the denominator. How much am I spending each, each year? That's my numerator. Numerator. You get a percentage. And so, uh, you know, it's just, this is a really, like you said, this whole answer is BS. Sufficient is a nice word here, right? Sufficient. Like uh, you want to make sure it's sufficient. Have you not done that analysis for 20 years? Because it's been sufficient for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about excessive for, for a very long time at this point. So if the whole goal is just to make sure that it's sufficient, we're already well beyond that. So th yeah, his response didn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and and I think the two, problem is, oh, sorry, Bill, go ahead. There's two issues with his answer. So there's this idea that um, he says, uh, we never looked at it as a percentage. We looked at it as based on needs. And if we look at just the needs of members of the church, we already know that there's a separate nonprofit outside of the LDS church uh, that used to be the Liahona Foundation. Now I think it's like the Bountiful something or other. But uh, they, it's uh, their whole purpose is to feed hungry Latter-day Saints in countries where the church doesn't use its bishop storehouse like it does in developed areas. And so we already know that there's needs. We already know that there are people who get a benefit in uh, in developed countries and in undeveloped or developing countries uh, that program does not work the same. So those Latter-day Saints go hungry. Those Latter-day Saints don't get sufficient for their needs. Meanwhile, the folks here in the United States get their mortgages paid, their grocery bills, sometimes even their car payment. So first, then the second thing is saying that they have enough years worth of use. They have plenty of years worth of use. How many years do you need? Is it 50 years enough? Is 75 years? Do we need 150 years worth of, of uh, uh, operating funds stored away? Because they're getting to the point where it's reaching absurdity. No, it's already past absurdity. I will tell you that two years of operating expenses is considered to be standard. In fact, my understanding is that Bill Gates, when he was starting up, his company, um, and maybe even today, is considered to be rather extreme by insisting on having two years worth of expenses in cash on hand. So two to three years is what you're going to have under big companies and the way they do things. So two to three years worth would be $6 billion, which is what the church spends on its expenses every year. $6 billion times two would be $12 billion. So $12 billion in two years, $12 billion to $18 billion is what Bill Gates would have in the bank if he were running this church as, a, as his company, as a Microsoft company. Instead of 12 to $18 billion, the church has $150 billion minimum sitting there in that account. So that is, I think it is absurd. And when he talks about sufficient, this is just another weasel word. Because if we say, and I'm not sure about my atomic bombs, and my math, but let's just say that 100 atomic bombs with a certain uh, megaton warhead, 100 of them are sufficient to destroy all life on the planet, all right? Well, if you say that, then you look at not 100, but 500 atomic bombs. Well, are those sufficient to destroy all life on the earth? Yes. How about 1,000 atomic bombs? Oh, those are sufficient to destroy all life on earth too. So after you've gotten to the point where you've really got the hundred and that's sufficient, you can say the same thing about anything else, no matter how much higher it is, and be accurate, 
but not really be illuminating. Right. Your thoughts, Spencer? Yeah, absolutely. You got All it. All right. So, and by the way, to make this clear, I think that what's going on is that the reporter, I think it's Sharon, is trying to get these different pieces of information, trying to get him to say some piece of information so they can hopefully use it in order to help calculate things. And his job is to resist that temptation and not go there no matter what. And he did a very good job of that because he refused to go there. All right, so do we have the next slide? Once again, from the Widow's Might Report, this is topic two. Up to 30 years of expenses saved. Okay, this is, yeah, this is the, the church right now. It's up to 30 years of expenses saved. It doesn't have two years or three years or even five years. It has 25 years if it's $150 billion. Once again, that's a conservative estimate. I just did a TikTok video on it outside. That's why I'm so uh, rosy because it's nice and uh, sunny out. Summer has come early to the Pacific Northwest. But they've got all this money for up to 30 years of expenses saved. So observations and clarifications from the widows might report. Number one, the church has not yet stated a policy regarding the number of years of expenses which should be saved. They don't have a policy. If they did, it probably wouldn't be 30 years because that's crazy. When Bill Gates has two years of expenses and he's considered by a lot of other people to be too conservative, yeah, 30 years is nuts. The church doesn't have a policy and this is why they will never have enough. It will always be sufficient. And then number two, we calculate the church had no debt and the following number of years of cash expenses in hand at year end. And Spencer, could you help describe this for the audience, the rest of this chart? Yeah, keep in mind too that these numbers are only if you were to take all of Enzyme Peak and turn it into cash. So over those 26 to 27 years, you're not earning interest. If it was earning interest, then the church could live into perpetuity. And Widows Might's already analyzed this. So it actually has enough on hand to exist forever without any more tithing. Um, this is only, this is the most conservative possible estimate that there is. This is saying, let's just set aside, let's put, let's put all the cash under a giant mattress and let's, um, and then let's just use the cash as it, as we need to. By the way, Spencer, you're hitting it on the head. So I've got money in a CD right now and my CD rate, by the way, Live Oak Bank and Synchrony Bank were the two best banks I could find for business and personal on CD rates. Their CD rates are around CD four. Bill? They're around four percent. So if you take a hundred and fifty billion and invest it just in CDs, you would have six billion in interest, which is the exact operating budget of the church. Hence, that hundred and fifty billion invested safely in a in a market which is pretty normal, meaning that interest rates are around six percent and CD rates on the high end are around four percent you actually can go forever now without needing another penny as long as you kept your operating cost at 6 billion. And we know that the church in developed areas is shrinking, at least plateauing. And we could expect over the next decade or two, the church is actually gonna cut cost as they lose members in developed areas. Right, and this yeah. is a good point, Bill, because what Spencer is saying, and we'll underscore it, is that this analysis on the slide looks at the funds that the church has as a concrete, non-growing yep. amount. Yep. So if they got no income, if everybody in the world stops paying tithing, all the members stop paying tithing, there's no more fast offerings, and they can't invest the money they have, even in a bank to get an interest or a big CD like you're talking about, Bill. Just the money they have on hand. In 1997, as I read this chart, Spencer, they would have had enough for six to seven years of operating expenses. Is that what that represents? Yep. And then it goes down through different years, 2007, 17, 21, and then 22, which is the latest year we have stats for, right? Then as of 2022, it's increased that they have enough money on hand without investing or any more income to last the church for 26 to 27 years and cover all their operating expenses. Yeah. Seems sufficient. Done. Yeah. I think it's sufficient. <laughs> I think they have sufficient for their needs. Right. And by the way, just to hit on what you guys are saying, and maybe we already said this to say it again, in another five years, they're going to have another 10 years worth of whatever it is. You know, it, this thing, this number keeps growing. RFM, you said it's already absurd. 
at what point does the church go, okay, enough's enough. We've got plenty saved. We're going to make it for another hundred years, basically, if we if we take this money and we're really smart about what we do with it. Um, at some point, you're just being ridiculous. And as you're already saying, it's already there. Like, how much more ridiculous are we going to get? That point was reached in 1997 when they started it. Yeah, six they to seven years. They had enough money on hand for six Twice to seven enough. years of operating expenses, and that's yeah. three times more than Bill Gates feels is necessary. Do I have by that the way right, in nineteen ninety? And by the way, nineteen ninety seven, whatever their operating budget was, it was certainly less than the six billion it is today. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I think that must have been factored in because they started it with seven billion, which today mm-hmm. would only cover one year plus yeah. a billion. Can you Spencer? imagine how exciting it would have been too if you were a faithful member back in nineteen ninety seven, and if they had decided to be transparent and said. We're going to grow this thing until we don't have to ask you for tithing because we're going to be a self-sustaining church. To be Elder Bednar said the, we're already there. Yeah, to be a part of that church, though, to say like, okay, well, it's it's completely self-sustaining in 2022. It probably wouldn't have taken as long because I would have been super excited. I would have started paying double tithing. We would have had a goal to reach. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It would have felt really good to be a part of something like that. And instead, I feel awful inside about it. Well, this is one of the things that continues to be able to disappoint me about the church, and maybe the most, is the missed opportunities that the church has and that it squanders. And I get the sense that that's kind of what was at the root of the misgivings that David Nielsen was expressing on the 60 Minute Show, too. Yeah. 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 He thought they were going to change the world, they were going to make it better, and no, they're just making money. They're not. For no yeah. reason, except for to make money. David, when are you going to use it, right? Never. They're making money for the sake of making money, and they're keeping it secret for the sake of keeping it secret. Yeah. There, I think that covers everything. Good night, folks. Thanks for joining us. (laughs) Now, let's go to the next slide. Can you take us through this one, Spencer? Yeah, it's just kind of saying like, oh, let's go ahead and take the church as an example for how we should deal with our finances if I had an, you know, the average salary in the United States of 67500 it would mean hoarding and hoarding wealth without giving any tithing, without giving to the poor or needy, until I had $1.8 million saved away, stocked away. That's what the church is essentially doing. If I had an, an annual salary of 200000 which represents the top 10% of savings in, or of salaries in the United States, it would mean holding that and and putting it into investments until it um, until I had raised 5.4 million. And only and so, after you, you know, say 5.4 million do you start giving into any charitable purpose. Correct. To any yeah, charitable purpose. Yeah, that's nuts. Isn't it? it I think that's a great slide. It earlier? really brings it home. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's really sad about that is that uh, there are a couple of articles out there that show that Utah is in the bottom 10 of saved retirement funds okay this is so important spencer please elaborate because we talked about this this morning and i thought this was fascinating yeah so like so for example there's a there's an app called empower insurance and um they have like an app that kind of looks at um it has free investing and budgeting and they have like a little dashboard where you can add things and it's a little anecdotal but it based on its users it finds that utah ranks last out of the 50 states and including dc so 51 out of 51 in average retirement savings. Um, And then there's another one by, um, there's a personal finance provider um, that's used as called Go Banking Rates or something like that. And they paired that data with the Federal Reserve System survey of consumer finances. And so you combine those two to figure out, well, how much do people need for retirement in one state versus how much they actually save for retirement. And, you know, honestly, as, as Americans, we're all kind of on average, falling short in terms of our retirement savings, but it's trying to find out which ones are worst. And in that ranking, Utah was ninth worst out of the 50 states. Um, They have a relatively lower cost of living, so they aren't going to be as, you know, so they maybe don't have to save up as much, but they don't save up almost anything. Well, I mean, can we guess why that is? You know, I think that's why it is for me. (laughs) I know that I'm in a position where basically I can never retire because I dutifully and faithfully paid tithing to the church for decades. Off the top, gross, because I wanted those gross blessings. I think I'm starting to get them now. But I wanted those gross blessings, right? So I paid the gross 10% on the gross earnings, plus generous fast offerings and everything, 
which comes off the top, which means that's 10% that I don't get to invest for myself for my own future. And I'm sure I'm not the only person who's in this position who ends up having sacrificed in order to make the church independently wealthy at the expense of me never being able to retire. <laughs> right. So you're asked, I mean, this is the context, right? People are, the church is encouraging people to give 10% of their income to a church so that that church can have a huge reserve for the future, huge, mm -hmm. absurdly huge. And by, and in the process, by paying that tithing, these members no longer have discretionary funds in order to emulate the church that they believe in. Um, and you know, that's, that's a little sad. It's ironic, right? But that's the way. Uh, it works. Yeah. And let's tie that back in because it's so fascinating to me that my anecdotal experience and what I think I'm not the only person in this position ends up being borne out by that uh, data that you found that when it comes to the amount per capita of retirement that people have set aside, Utah ranks 51st out of 51, all 50 states, including the uh, District of Columbia, dead last. Dead last. Mormons have less retirement set aside than anybody else, at least residents of Utah, which, you know, a lot of Mormons there. So that's an extrapolation, but I think it's reasonable. So why is that? Well, it's because they're given the top 10% to the church. That's why they don't have as much money as every single other state, including Alabama, Mississippi, um, yeah. West Virginia. You want to look at uh, New Mexico? And I'm only listing them there. I'm sure they're wonderful places to visit, but you know, come on. Yeah. They have, Utah's dead last. There's a reason for it. And I think this is the reason. Yeah. And Utah's economy isn't hurting, right? So it's not like it's not possible. So um, yeah, this is weird. It's a, it, it must mean that the tithing blessings aren't coming in this life. They must be coming in the next life. So the church could do a giant favor and stop requiring tithing at the hands of its members, and it would still have plenty of money, again, 26 or 27 if it's not invested. And I yeah. understand the stock market's risky. So take it all out, put it into, again, CDs and savings accounts and whatever, and you've got plenty to go for 50 years. Yeah, you could even, I mean, even just to be safe, just put it to 2% tithing or something. and Yeah, mm -hmm. still goes 50 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and I get what you're saying, I think, Spencer. So let me uh, try it out on you that it's the situation where the church is telling its members, OK, we want you to uh, be frugal. We want you to have a budget. We want you to live within your means and we want you to pr um, provide for your family and set aside for the future. OK, set aside for the future. But before you do all that stuff, just give us 10 percent off the Make top. Make sure you pay your tithing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so uh, there were times. So I was a stake auditor several times and I was also in a bishopric in a prior life. And there were times when I would talk to people and I was asked to like lead a, a personal finance seminar in the, in the ward. And the whole time, these people that were really struggling with finances, it wasn't that they were struggling with budgeting. They were really good at budgeting because they didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. They had to know how to budget. Right. It was that their income wasn't high enough. So even when I went through their budget, I would be like, geez, I don't know how you're gonna make this work. Like the very first thing that I would cut if I were you is tithing. That's what I would have done personally. And did you as tell I'm sitting there with that? them. Did you tell any of them any did you tell that to any of them as a bishop? Not as no. Um as a as a leader or sorry, as a discussion leader in the personal financing, this is probably the last thing I did before I left the church. And so I I did express my personal opinions on tithing and I didn't think that they should pay it. But um yeah, it was I mean, I always get these callings because as soon as I tell people that I'm in finance or that I'm an accountant, suddenly the spirit whispers to them, stay yeah. auditor. And that's what, <laughs> I don't know how that happens every time, but it must be the spirit. Don't let you have any influence and keep you close to the people who need to watch you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Are we set for the next slide? Let's do it. Let me uh, put it up. Let's do that. Ta-da. All right. Spencer, can you help us out with this one? Yeah, so this is like so this is the called the five percent rule. It's an unofficial rule for churches. Um, in with uh, private foundations, there's this general rule that you have to hit around five percent if you have some assets in reserve. Um, in terms of how much you should be paying for your mission, so charitable, uh, charitable efforts, right? And so the idea here is if we were to apply that rule, that's generally applied to private foundations to the church, 
then that would mean that you should take out 5% of the Enzyme Peaks assets any given year towards the mission of the church. It could be towards what we would call humanitarian efforts. It could be towards uh, BYU. It could be towards any charitable effort or um, mission that is related to the church. And for that to happen, the church would have to, in addition to what it's already spending in $6 billion, it would have to have an annual payout of 7 to $8 billion per year and use those funds for charitable purposes. Now, if this wasn't a church, if this is a private foundation, if it didn't do this, it would be at risk of losing its tax exempt status. Because it's a religion, it's not at risk of losing its tax exempt status, but this is just kind of the math that other organizations are subject to by the IRS. So Did what is the idea, if you keep paying 5% out, aren't you gonna spend it down to nothing? In time. No, no, absolutely not. So it's the whole 5% rule is based on this 8%. I know what you're doing, RFM, you already know. <laughs> yeah. It's based on, you know, an assumption that you're earning 8% per year. Um, and that's th- uh, the extra 3% covers inflation or, or, you know, off years or something like that. So 5% should keep it going. In other words, you can keep saving more and more money. The account can keep growing, but whatever the account is, the value of 5% of that should be spent in the mission of your work each year. Right. Yeah. And, By the way, you as, can as see- As a nonprofit, that, this is kind of the way that nonprofits are designed. Like when you yeah. think about the accounting for nonprofits, you say, this is how much money I have. Now let's think about how much we can spend this year to do the good that we wanna do. And the church has flipped it on its head. The church treats it like a for-profit organization. They say, let's see how much money we can bring in and then let's keep it as large as we can and reduce our expenses so that we can't spend so that we spend the very bare minimum towards our mission each year and you can see why on the other side of that coin they really love being a church and having the benefits of being a religious organization sure yeah yeah is it correct that the church does follow that pattern, that formula with regard to BYU's endowment. Yeah, it's close enough it, within. So 4.25% on average would, would be how much they take out of BYU's endowment. And so the IRS wouldn't have a problem with that. Right. So they know how to do it with the BYU endowment, but they just refuse to do it when it comes to the $150 billion they have in Enzyme Peak investment account. Right. Because BYU is an endowment. But it's not an endowment. Enzyme Peak isn't an, an endowment when it comes to the rest of the church. All it right. isn't treated like one. Got it. All right. Any other questions or comments about this slide before we go to the next one? Okay. Now, this is a quote. It's a little tiny quote. It's on this slide. It's called Bad Legal Advice? Question mark. And what it says is Bishop Christopher Waddell told us it was the church's lawyers who told them to create the shell companies. Now, this is what Sharon Alfonsi actually says, and we'll play that clip. It's a very brief clip, as you might imagine. We don't actually have Bishop Waddell saying those words. We have Sharon Alfonsi saying he said those words. The church and Ensign Peak, a total of $5 million. Bishop Christopher Waddell told us it was the church's lawyers who advised them to create the shell companies. Okay, that really that really rankles me on a personal level, Spencer. Do you have any comments about it? You know, I'm not a lawyer, and I know what Mark Pugsley would say. I know that you've said about this and what Widows Might has said about this, that it doesn't make sense that they would that they could possibly be doing this, that they could have done this following legal advice, that any lawyer would offer legal advice to do this. But normally in a normal organization, the way that things work, like let's say in a university setting, if somebody were to pass the blame to someone else, then those people are held accountable, right? And so which lawyers were fired? Which lawyers were fined by the SEC? Mm -hmm. They are not... They are non-existent. The church didn't hold them accountable. Um, the the SEC didn't hold them accountable. This these people don't exist, right? They're ghosts. And so I just think that I I don't think that they that this is real, right? Because yeah, of it's that, it's a lie. It's a total do- dodge. It's BS. Okay, because the problem is 
is that they know what they were doing. Roger Clark, I think I did a TikTok on this one as well, if it wasn't a podcast. Roger Clark has, he's the name. He's well respected when it comes to investment. He's written stuff that you got to read. It was our podcast, wasn't it, Spencer, when you were on Radio Free Mormon? Yeah, yeah. he's done all this stuff. He has been the head of EPA, Enzyme Peak, from its inception in 1997 until the year 2000. So for 23 years during all of this, he's the head guy. And he knows what he's doing and he knows how to file the freaking 13F forms in order to give the transparency demanded and required by law to the federal government. Yeah. And in fact, if you need to prove that, he has his own private investment firm running concurrently at the same time during these 22 years. It's almost exactly concurrent with EP when he's the head of EP. And guess what? His private firm, which is called Analytic Investors, I think, Something Analytic like Investor, I think it's singular. Yeah, they had no trouble filing all the 13 Fs, the quarterly 13 Fs, and they filed them correctly, and they weren't hiding crap. So yeah. he knows how to do it. This isn't something where you need a lawyer to tell you how to do it right. They got so even the, if they got a lawyer, they yeah. had controls in place. And wasn't it one of the apologetic pieces that you were citing that talked mm -hmm. about how amazingly experienced these guys are? Yes. <laughs> All so the Henry credentials. Eyring. This is the problem. This is the backfire effect. When you go to the credentials of the people who are in charge, you go, ooh, ah, look at all the credentials. Well, at the same time, what you're doing is you're stabbing yourself in your foot or shooting yourself in your foot or something. Because the more experience and credentials they have, the more inexcusable it is what they did. Right. Yeah. I mean, so we it, should go to the slide. We may actually have covered some, if not all of what's in the next slide in the Widow's Might Report. It sounds like what you're saying, RFM, is that like, I know that murder is against the law. But if the lawyers told me that it's okay to murder, I'm still liable for murdering someone because I knew better, right? You can't just say that I'm no longer liable because a lawyer told me such mm -hmm. and such was okay. Isn't that kind of what's going on? Yes, and the other thing that we know because in the order, that nine-page order from the SEC, no mention was made of the church ever saying the lawyers gave us bad advice. Mm, that's right. Because if they had done so, it would have shown up in there because that would be a potential defense that the SEC would have had to have investigated. Yeah. The problem with bringing it up is that as soon as you say my lawyers gave me bad advice, you have waived the attorney-client privilege, at least insofar as that specific issue, which means now SEC gets to talk to the lawyers and say, Hey, this is what Waddell told me that he got bad legal advice. And they also get to look at all the emails and all the communications between the lawyer. The church didn't bring it up. And we know they didn't bring it up to the SEC because it's nowhere mentioned in the SEC order because they knew I'm going to say this. Okay. Because they knew that if they brought it up, an investigation would show that it wasn't true. Otherwise they would have brought it up. If you got a good defense, you're going to bring it up, but you're not going to bring it up if that means they can investigate it and find out that you're not telling them the truth right. about this defense. So they decided to wait, wait until the investigation is done, the order's done, and now they come out and start talking about, oh, we got bad advice from lawyers, which they never brought up to the SEC because it would have blown up on them if they had, but they're trying to put one over on the members. Which, That's by the way, take. has them talking out both sides of their mouth. So just so the listeners are understanding... On one instance, when it worked in your favor, you claimed that it, the decision came from the first presidency and that's who initiated the conversation and that's who made the decisions to proceed and do it that way. And then when it benefits you on the other end, you say that it was the lawyers who told you to do that. And so in one of those two instances, you're either lying implicitly or you're lying explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know yeah. that the first presidents who was involved, number one, they got fined a million dollars, just to make it really clear. But how much did Curtin and McConkie get fined? I don't think anything specifically. Nothing. Zero. Ah, they weren't even point. investigated. No. Nope. But here's the deal. And I can't remember. Maybe this was Spencer who brought it up to me. If you take Roger Clark and get the church out of the picture, and the church is not involved in this in any way, there is no way that Roger Clark doesn't file the 13 F's appropriately, which means the church is the one who's telling him 
giving him the directions. We want you to hide this. Come up with a way to hide it. So they end up coming up with a way to hide it. Roger Clark, bless his heart, compromises his professional integrity and goes along with it and will have to live with the repercussions to his reputation as a result. But the church, the leadership, the first presidency is the one who is pulling the strings, giving the directives, and making sure that this happened. This filing of false documents and this whole conspiracy of the 13 shell companies with the federal government, it was done at their direction, and that's why they got fined a million dollars to demonstrate their culpability. Right. Okay, next slide. Yeah. And I think we kind of went over all of these points. RFM. Okay, good. Yeah, we're good. We one. went over the slide without even going over the slide. It's good. Okay. Now, here's another clip. This is with um, Sharon Alfonsi uh, and Chris Waddell. It goes back and forth, and we're going to play the video of this conversation. Secrecy builds mistrust. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't feel it's being secret. We feel it's being confidential. What's the difference? The difference is, um, I guess it's a point of view that's confidential in order to maintain the focus on what our purpose is and what the mission of the church is, rather than the church has X amount of money. But don't you agree this would be a non-issue if there was more transparency? No, because then everyone would be telling us what they wanted us to do with the money. Okay, this is one of the classic places where I think questions are being asked, answers are being given, and they really have no relationship whatsoever, except one comes first and then the other one follows. What do you think, Spencer? Yeah, this is one of, the, I mean, this is the best part of the show, right? It's where he does, confuses up synonyms and so, and acts as if they're different things. Um, well, we all know what was happening with the prep, right? The prep oh, was, sure. we all know what they're saying. Okay, it's not secret, it's sacred. But <laughs> that's what they've been doing for decades. And so right. that's not going to play to the general public. So we got to come up with a different word than, than sacred. So let's say it's not secret. Um, I know, it's confidential. And then I guess they didn't think beyond that step really well. Yeah, I mean, let's just take him at his word and let's presume that this is what they're doing. You know, they're not worried about it. the reason that they're keeping it confidential is to maintain focus on what their purpose is and what the mission of the church is rather than church has X amount of money. How, what would be, how would, um, what would be the best way of being able to focus on your purpose? In what way could you better fulfill your purpose? Well, if I was directing the church, I'd love to know how much I had in resources in order to fulfill the church's purposes. So why is it necessary for the rest of the Quorum of Twelve to not know any of this? This isn't just the lay membership that doesn't get to know. These are people that are making decisions that are clearly involved with carrying out the purpose of the church. They don't know. So it's not just about who needs to know and who doesn't need to know. If the Quorum of the Twelve doesn't get to know either. It's just, it's, it got to the point that it's so secret that even the decision makers don't know. That's odd to me. How, how is your mission hurt more detrimentally by um, announcing how much you have versus what you're doing, which is saying, we're not going to tell you how much we have. Hence, you're creating a, a distrust. You're creating a perceived deception, a perceived obfuscation. It seems that that would be much riskier than just saying, hey, you know what? You're right. We've got 150 billion. You know what? Actually, you underestimated it. We have 179 billion. It seems that the waffling and the holding back and because we already know it's close, like the way this all goes down, everybody watching knows the church has something around 150 billion. There's no argument. So it's not like, well, if we if we're really quiet, they might think we only have twenty billion. Like that's not real. Yeah. So both scenarios work in the disfavor of the church, but the one that works in more disfavor of the church is the dishonesty, deception, and obfuscation. 
Yeah. Right. And look at your... all the negatives, all the negatives that any anybody can see. And, you know, Bill, you've laid them out very well. All these negatives that go along with the way they're approaching it. Either they can't see that or they believe that the positives of the secrecy, the confidentiality, outweigh the negatives. I don't think that's, that's not rational to me, but right. I think those are the only two options. What do you think, Spencer? Yeah, it kind of to Bill's point, like he's, you know, uh, Bishop Waddell said, no, the problem wouldn't go away because and every, because then if we were transparent, everyone would be telling us what they wanted to do with the money. But that's what people are already doing. It's We're already, already doing that. It's a non sequitur. If we told people how much money we had, then people would tell us how, how to spend the money. I'll, yeah. I'll we're already this. telling you. Yes. And what we're I'll saying, we're not telling you how to spend the money. We're just telling you, spend the money. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And that's what they don't like. They don't want to be told to spend the money because right now they're in the business of not spending the money. Yeah. And by the way, I think this is going to be a future slide, but can I bring it up here? It's very important to stress the policy of the church since the 60s, the last time it was getting underwater and N. Eldon Tanner came in with the Superman cape to save the day. They came up with this policy, which they follow to this day. The church will never spend more than it takes in. So now it's $7 billion a year, give or take a million. The church's policy will never allow them to spend more than that $7 billion that they take in. That's right. Which means they will cut programs, they'll tighten the budget, they'll do whatever they need to do have members to clean follow the that policy. I'm sorry, what, Bill? Have members clean the toilets. Yes. Yeah. And they'll do that when they don't, okay. And they do that when they don't need to. And I think that's really going to be what's going to cause the revolt. It's going to be the toilet cleaners revolt of 2025. <laughs> that's what yeah. I predict. I, I wrote this. I wrote. I, I said this to you yesterday. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. And it came into play here. And I'll probably say this again at the end. What is the risk of being understood to be dishonest and deceptive in hiding things? Whatever that risk is, it is judged by them to be less risky than telling the truth. Yeah. It just doesn't add up to me, though. I mean, isn't that odd? How does it's anybody so reach that conclusion? Yeah. I feel like you should quote Shakespeare from The Merchant of Venice here. Good name and man or woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel to the soul. I won't go on. But the idea is that your good name, that's all you have. Who steals yeah. my purse steals trash. Yeah. That's nothing. Yeah. You can get more money later on. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and leaves me poor indeed. The church has given away the single most precious thing that any institution or individual can have, and that is their integrity, their credibility, and their believability. And I just used two words that were synonyms. So there you go. And remember, <laughs> you go. Bill Real was excommunicated to protect the good name of the church. Yeah. The, 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 to protect the good name of the church is one of the, uh, em, the, the dominant reasons for why disciplinary courts are held. Mm -hmm. the, the good name of the church is important they say, but right now the good name of the church is being decimated by the top 15 and nobody cares. Nobody blinks. And to your point, RFM, when you talked about this policy from the sixties, what that means is that as long as they follow that policy, they will never use Enzyme Peaks reserves. Right. And that's why it says in the show, Money goes in, but it doesn't come out. And that's why that tax um, professor who used to be chief counsel with the IRS or something. What's his name again, Spencer? Oh, shoot. That's okay. I Whatever the guy's today. name is. What was his name? I caught you flat-footed. He no, says, it's like the Hotel California. The EPA account. You know, you can, you can check in, but you never leave. Right. Money goes in and never comes out because that's the policy of the church. So they get $7 billion a year tithing, $6 billion to cover expenses, take that million, put it into the investment account, and of course it's going to grow like crazy, which it has been doing for over 20 years now. But that was the main point that I did want to make. That's the policy of the church, and that's why they're in the position they're in. 
and why it is they have this incredible opportunity to do good in the world, which they are blowing, mm -hmm. which they are forfeiting. And instead of doing good in the world, they are hiding stuff and they're hiding the massive amount of wealth they have and thinking that that's okay. Not only is it unchristian what the LDS Church is doing, I would propose that some could view it as anti-Christian. That's how diametrically opposed what the church is doing with its wealth to what Jesus taught in the New Testament. And presumably be teaching the, the, the apostles the same thing today when he has the, the meetings with them on the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple every Thursday morning. It, it, one more point, though, I guess, about this is that if, you know, one of the concerns is this criticism idea, right? But just as much as transparency is the way that things work nowadays when it comes to public companies, so is criticism. They go hand in hand. Companies are used to criticism. Organizations nowadays are used to criticism. So I don't understand why the church can't take criticism the same way any other organization would take criticism. So for example, Apple has a ton of cash on hand. Mm -hmm. It has had tons of cash on hand and shareholders have approach them with criticism saying, why are you sitting on all this cash? Is it because you don't have any new ideas coming forward? Should we be worried about that? You mm -hmm. should be spending it on our R and D. You should be giving it back as a dividend. Why is it, why is it trapped overseas? You know, they're asking these questions and Apple has to answer. They have to face those critic criticisms and the church is like, we will do anything. We'll break the law. So we don't have to face criticism. It just is odd to me. As an academic, I face criticism every single day with my research papers, right? We're all used to criticism. We're open to it. And I just don't understand why the church is just is acting like babies here. Like, Can I tell you why, Spencer? Because it's BS. That's not the reason. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You're telling me this church isn't used to taking some criticism? Give me a yeah. break. These have all of the earmarks, all of these excuses have all of the earmarks of things that were made up after the fact and after they got caught in order to try and retroactively justify why it was they did in the first place. And that's why none of their reasons hold any water. That's why they're all ridiculous. And this is another ridiculous excuse. That's why I say, I don't know what's going on there. It's either secrecy for secrecy's sake, or it's secrecy in order to cover up something else that they don't want. The membership in the world to know and i don't mean to sound sinister hmm. but i think those are the only two options as far as i'm concerned and and i'll just throw out here i know that you would want to slow me down and say hey we don't really have evidence for that but it seems strange to me these 15 guys at the top they get a living stipend of 150,000. sure they get some good health care free car from the uh, uh larry h miller group good job larry h miller group you guys are doing great over there nice guy um yeah, yeah, they get, uh, I'm sure, other perks. Kids go to college, we've heard. Um, but it doesn't make sense that 15 of Christ, prophet, seers, and revelators making small living stipends would be this invested in, like, let's break the law. Let's make lots of money. We got to make it. We got to make tons of money. It feels, again, from an outsider who's just being rational and using a little bit of conjecture, it seems as though they benefit to a much greater extent than we know. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense for 15 guys to break the rules to accumulate 27 years worth of wealth at $150 billion if all they get is just a little tiny bit of that. Spencer, this brings me a question to you, which I haven't gone over with you in advance, so I apologize, but... I've heard rumors, and as far as I know, these are unsubstantiated. So these are just rumors of financial wrongdoing with some of this money that there's certain millions or billions that have turned up missing. I don't know if you've heard those rumors. And if you have, or even if you have, do you know if there's any truth to them or any reason to think that they are perhaps more than rumors? I think that those rumors come straight from David Nielsen's allegation, his 90 page report to the Senate Finance Committee but I don't have any evidence of it. Some of his allegations are things that uh, require negative evidence. In, in other words, like they say, like he, you know, he alleges that the church doesn't file its FBAR filings. Well, in order to get evidence of that, we'd have to show 
that they didn't, right? It's, uh, so it, it's weird. Mm -hmm. I don't have any evidence of that. I'm a big fan of evidence, but you go on, Bill Real, with your conspiracy yeah, theories. Yeah, you go. You yeah. got it's open <laughs> season on your. It your, doesn't um, make sense for 15 good guys just trying to build the kingdom of God to break the rules egregiously in order to make 150 billion dollars, which is way more than they need, unless they need more, then you'd need it. And yeah, I, I mean, I agree more. with you that there's something missing. Yeah, there is something missing. Yeah. And there's a reason they don't want to open the books up and they don't want everybody to have a good close look at it. I will, I will go so far as to say that in a closed system that is shrouded in secrecy mm -hmm. and intentionally yeah. so, with mm -hmm. decades long conspiracies to hide what they're doing from the federal government and the members, I will say that that kind, and $150 billion in the yeah. mix, I would say that that kind of environment is ripe for abuse. Especially if these 15 guys have egos and they're all wanting to be seen as equal or greater than the others. Yeah, I would think they probably, about enough, they probably have about enough money to buy up Jackson County by now. Or Google. How much is Jackson County going for nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. Apparently more. <laughs> no, I mean, East St. Louis, what are you going to do? My apologies to any listeners from East St. Louis. <laughs> So, are we ready for the next slide? <laughs> okay, so this is topic four. Church leaders have given three reasons for the secrecy. Observations and clarifications. From our launch report, I guess that would be their first report at Widow's Might, it says in 2020, so it has been a few years, leaders gave three reasons for keeping the church's wealth secret. So I'm going to give the rationale, and then I'll let Spencer weigh in on the however, which is the widow's might response to the rationale given by the church. Number one, if members knew how much money we had, they might stop paying their tithing, i.e. donating. What does widow's might say to that, Spencer? Well, widow's might says that hiding the money is going to hurt trust, right? And this is it erodes trust. This is what they were referring to in the 60 Minutes episode. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling fear because then they no longer trust you. And so they no longer pay tithing. Um, and so you end up getting what you were avoiding in, in essence by, by hiding, the, hiding the wealth. Interesting. And also, I have to think back to good old Joseph F. Smith, who said back in 1907, I think it was, that the time was going to come when they had a, the church had enough to pay off its you know its bills from year to year, and when that time came, that they weren't going to be asking the members to pay tithing anymore. Seems like we have a perfect moment for the church to fulfill a prophecy mm -hmm. and call it a check mark for God's revelation. And they could have done that in 1997 with the seven billion dollars they had to start up this EP account, but apparently church leaders are bound and determined to prove Joseph. F. Smith to be a false prophet. That, I think so. This so is the probably the, this is probably the most likely the 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 real reason, though, don't you think? Yeah, but it's no oh, longer useful, right? This because is what now, Roger Clark said. Roger Clark, the head of the EP, was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying that the concern of the church is if members knew how much money they had, they wouldn't be inclined to donate or contribute. Might have been his word. Yeah, but but if the church were to go on 60 minutes and say they have it mm -hmm. versus going on 60 minutes and saying, you're probably right, but I'm not going to tell you. It seems like either way, anybody paying attention now knows they have it. Hence this excuse, at least from this point forward is no longer effective. Right. And this was one of the questions I was hoping the producer would get to when we talked about the questions um, that should be asked to the church leadership. It was now that the cat's out of the bag, do you plan on being more transparent? Mm -mm. And Sh Sharon, I think, got to that point. I think she's, she didn't say now that the cat's out of the bag because it's still an allegation. Still but she said, it, going forward, do you plan on being transparent? I think we're going to cover that later. Mm -hmm. Just odd, right? Yeah. I what could reason? see being a member of the church in good standing, or maybe your Catholic friend, Spencer, and watching Bishop Waddell's performance and just going, why is this guy being so weaselly? Why is he just not going to say how much money they have? Why is he not going to say what percentage goes out? Why, why go on at all? Why is such a secret? Why go on at all? And why even answer any questions? You're not going to tell us anything. So just don't even go on. Just refuse to comment. Yeah, I think the church made the decision. I think it was a good decision that to have somebody from the church show up would play better 
Then yeah. to say we contacted the church for comment and they declined to respond. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it might have been the same because effectively that's all that happened. You're right. <laughs> Except there's a face there. There's a face yeah. there, and he didn't lose his composure. I think he did a fine job like I did before. Overall, I think it was better. But really, as far as information goes, he didn't contribute anything to the discussion, as far as I can tell. Maybe there, there might be a couple of nuggets, but I think they're minor. So the second rationale, now that these are just excuses that are used, I do believe that the first rationale is the one that is at play. They don't want members to know because they don't want them to stop donating and paying their tithing. So the second excuse is members might mimic church investments. We don't want to let them know what our investments are and what our portfolio has because we are so scared. We are such a scared $150 billion church that we're worried that our members will mimic what we do and they'll be as madly successful as we are. <laughs> no, actually what they say is, <laughs> that's really what it is though, isn't it, Spencer? Oh, we're worried they'll mimic us and then, you know, they'll have a bad year and they'll blame us, you know, and they'll, there'll be all this criticism again. What is the widow's might response to that excuse, Spencer? Well, when you invest, you know that you, you have some risk involved. And I even think that a, an easier response to this is just, if you explain to them that the 13 Fs don't work that way, that you can't really mimic uh, someone's investments through a 13 F filing, then that would probably, that whole concern would go away. Yeah. Isn't it also kind of uh, uh, taken away this excuse by the fact that um, on a quarterly basis, I understand the church has to disclose what its investments are. Any corporation has to, not in real time necessarily, no. but like 90 days later, you have to file what your your holdings are and your portfolio consists of. That's right. It's 45 days later. And by 45. then the market has moved on. Right. So you don't see it until day 44 and a half when it's finally provided. Mm -hmm. And so all of that information is very stale information. So members would not want to mimic those investments. The church could emphasize that you shouldn't. And that would be that. I don't that think would that would be an easy fix for that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Mm. And the third excuse is the public might critique. Oh, there's that criticism again. This church sure doesn't like to be criticized. The public might critique uses of sacred funds. That's where uh, Bishop Waddell went to, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the excuse that came out loud and clear at the end of that last sound clip. And what's the um, widow's might report response to that? Well, if you're worried about criticism, maybe you ought to think twice about whether that criticism is valid or not, um, is essentially what widow's might is saying. Hmm. If you're that worried about it. You know, if you, if you think that you can defend the criticism, then you don't care. You're not scared of the criticism as much. Can yeah. I ask both of you a question? This is going to sound ridiculous. What is the theoretical reason why every bishop has two counselors, every stake president has two counselors, every president has two counselors in the LDS church? So they can give different points of view. I, I thought it right? was so they could split the work up because it's too much for one person to do after they've done their 40 hour a week job. Well, that's why I think I said theoretically. Yeah. But isn't that the idea? Good you want advice. different people throwing mm -hmm. in ideas so you can yeah. have different perspectives. I mean, my gosh, Bill, how many times have I been talking to you and you come up with a perspective I had not even considered? Vice versa. Yeah. And I would not have considered it. And same with Spencer. This is why when you have smart people around you with different perspectives, it increases your effectiveness uh, as, a, as a bishop, as a state president, as a whatever. And yet here, they're just saying, well, we can't have any criticism. We can't have any contrary ideas about what it is we're using this money for because we, we're just so weak and we're going to clutch our pearls as a church and shriek and run out of the room if anybody has a different idea. So we're going to keep everything secret. This is another BS excuse. When you walk it out and think about what it means, and you only have to think for like 20 seconds, maybe 10 tops, it doesn't make any sense. And by the way, you've made it the deceptiveness and going on 60 Minutes and the SEC report. It's already done that. Like the everybody paying attention already knows the church has too much money and it's not using it to help people. Hence, anybody who's in the know, who's paying attention to the news and watching things come out of Mormon land, recognizes that the church is not using its money effectively and has better ideas for what it could do. Hence, their reasoning 
became null and void by their own behavior, which was unethical anyway. Right. All they're doing is taking a bad situation that they made and, make and it making worse. it worse. Amen. And thank you, Bill, because that is one of the key points here. I think there's so much noise around this whole issue. But one of the key points is the church has a ton of money, $150 billion, okay? Thank you for bleeping me there, Bill. Yeah. You're good on that mute button, I'll tell you. <laughs> you got $150 billion, and it's all going in, and it's all growing, and it's not coming out. And then the question is, okay, so how much is too much? And everybody gets to look at it, make their own independent determination. Are you okay with that? Do you think that's what Jesus's church should be in the business of doing? Or should it be mm -hmm. helping people? And mm -hmm. obviously different people come to different conclusions. I think it's very clear what side that I would come down on. But, you know, what we can agree on is important. And I think what we can agree on, $150 billion and nothing's going out except for two instances. And one was to prop up beneficial life. And the other one was to help with City Creek Mall. That's it. Yeah. All right. Do we have the next slide? Neither one of those save souls in the celestial kingdom. The City Creek Mall or beneficial life? No. Yeah. No, okay. they don't. Just they don't even sure. help poor people in the here and now. Oh, we've got another little quote here. This is a little quote. We do have the clip, but it says, last year, this is Sharon Alfonsi saying this, last year, the church says it spent over a billion dollars on humanitarian aid, including food production. Oh, this is where they have the clip of the, the place where they're making all the loaves of bread. Church says it spent over a billion dollars on humanitarian aid, including food production. Yeah, I think that got started a little bit late, but that's okay. We read it, and that's what it says. Um, so let's see what the widow's might has to say about this billion dollars claim that the church is making, because apparently the church is monkeying with the statistics yet again. They're saying things that are designed to make people think that they're actually spending a billion dollars in 2022 on humanitarian aid. When really the vast majority of the vast majority of that, I understand, like eighty percent of that billion dollars, is actually church welfare. It's fast offerings, completely separate. Do I have that right, Spencer? Yeah, that's right. Can you so explain? So it's that kind more of weird because, audience? like, either in twenty so back in twenty eighteen, they would say, since nineteen eighty five, we have given two point five billion total in humanitarian aid. And so then suddenly it went from 2.5 billion in, in 40 years to 1 billion in one year. That's quite the ramp up that we would have heard about. And so really what's going on is they're changing the way that they're accounting for it, which whatever, that's fine. They want to account for it that way. But I, but I think that it's interesting. I, to me, I actually think that it's great that they're spending $825 million on fast offerings. I think that's great. I have nothing against that. I would prefer that they be a little more transparent about it and if they aren't transparent about it it's going to get them into trouble we're going to see mm -hmm. that in, in the next topic why this will get them into trouble because well, later got, on they're going to say we're going to double our humanitarian aid well is this the humanitarian aid they're going to double no it's the humanitarian aid of that's the small humanitarian aid that they're talking so, about so 2022 they claim one billion dollars or 1.02 billion dollars right yeah they had to get over that hump for the yeah, and I'm sure that was a, a huge yes moment when they got there. But they, they monkeyed with the numbers enough to where they figured we'll add in the fast offerings. So we've got 220, 2022, 1 billion, we'll round it to 1 billion. And out of that, over 800, no, excuse me, yeah, 800 million. So 80% right. of the billion was all fast offerings. And the actual humanitarian aid, and when I say that, I mean what people think of, not the faster offerings, but what they're actually helping people out with outside the church. That's not based upon being a member of the church and being a member in good standing, but just humanitarian aid for humanitarian aid's sake was 20% of that amount. It was around maybe 200 million. Is it's that great correct? though, by the way. 200 million sorry, is great. Right? 200 million is great. It's not yeah. that much, but- It's better you know. than a sharp stick in the eye. 
Right. I mean, it's, it's that 200 million is awesome. What a great start. And you know what, honestly, between 2021 and 2022, it almost doubled, which is great. And they're, so they're in the, in the process of doubling. They saw mm-hmm. from 2021 to 2022, they're doubling. But what's interesting about that is when they, they can't on one side say we gave over 1 billion in humanitarian aid and then say, we're going to double it. And we have been working on doubling it when they haven't gone from 1 billion to 2 billion. Yes. And this is why this uh, slide is so good because yeah. it shows where the doubling is really occurring. It's occurring in that much smaller amount that is humanitarian aid and not in the fast offerings, which is the 80% of the billion. So what they're indicating is, is that this entire amount of 1 billion, which they're saying incorrectly is for humanitarian aid, that's going to double and then double again. And that's their promise. But actually it's probably not saying it's doubling from a billion to 2 billion, and then it will double again to 4 billion. They're probably looking at this much smaller number of humanitarian aid, which is doubled from, uh, is that 55 to 115 million? I'm sorry, those those numbers are so small. I can't it's, read them without it's my It's 95 screen. to 115 in 2021, and then it jumped up to 175 to 195 million, somewhere in there for 2020. Okay. So that looks like that maybe has about doubled. So yeah. it's much more likely that's what Bishop Waddell is talking about, that the right. smaller amount has doubled and that maybe it'll double again. But when it doubles again, it won't be $4 billion. It'll be around $400 million. Yeah. yeah. So I got a couple of questions here. So does does volu- the, the church's lay ministry and volunteer workforce, which is significant, are they counting hours worked as part of this? Um, for some things, yeah. So for okay. missionary efforts, service missionaries, things like that, yeah. Okay. Next question is the giving machines they put out around Christmas time, these big red vending machines. Uh, complete strangers to the church walk down, you know, the, the square at New York and they throw 50 bucks into a vending machine. Church collects the money. That money, they're going to count it as a donation to the church. And then they're going to take that money and buy, you know, a can of soup for a hungry kid in, in one of the places in Africa. I assume they're also counting someone else's money being put into the vending machine as part of their humanitarian aid. That's correct. Yeah. And so when you take away the hours and you take away the fact that they put vending machines up to only act as a middleman, but then to be able to count the money, we're actually left wondering what the actual lower number might be. And there are probably other loopholes where you get to count things as cash equivalent when in reality they're not. And my, I would love some transparency here where I can actually see the actual amount of church money that came from church members that was given in humanitarian aid in 2022 or 2023 or any damn year for that matter. Yeah. And they do give some of that. And so widows might has tried to parse that out a little bit, but they don't do it consistently year over year. And that's been the problem. And so it does seem as though this humanitarian aid that's given, it's usually cash donations to, to outside organizations which is a very credible, you know, you have a paper trail. It's not hours donated or anything like that. It's a, it's a $40 million donation. Those are the good ones, in my opinion. This light green in the graph, those are the ones I want doubling. Anyway, those are the ones that I think are really uh, probably making a difference. The donations to the Red Cross or to the Feeding America organization, things like that. Okay. Good points, Bill. Are we ready yeah. for the next slide? This is another short clip from Bishop Waddell where he says, oh, we will double the humanitarian work again and then again. Now, he says work here. I don't know if he's using that intentionally instead of aid or if he's just, you know, uh, maybe just talking and doesn't use exactly the word he meant to. Of course, now we're all suspicious because he's being so deceptive and hiding everything. Mm -hmm. We're naturally suspicious where he says we will double the humanitarian work again and then again. But this is the one where we're questioning whether it's talking about the little green bars of 200 million or the big bars of uh, of 1 billion. And to me, there's not really a question. We we know this is this is more of a problem of them reporting it the wrong way. But it's going to be it's going to be the smaller one. It's going to be the faith blind aid. And, and to notice when he words it this way, it can easily include the giving machines and the volunteer hours. 
Yeah, or fast offerings. It could Oops. include all of it, yeah. but it's yeah. not. So basically, if I'm understanding this correctly, at one and the same time, while they're claiming a billion dollars in humanitarian aid, when he says we'll double it and then double it again, really, it's already been, well, let's just say they double it, okay, from 200 to 400, and then they double it again to Whoa. 800. Don't get what? crazy. Well, let's just say they do, okay? Yeah. I, I have no idea how we'll know, but let's just say they're, he's telling the truth, okay? And they'll double it to 800 million. Well, what he's indicating is they're going to increase it to 4 billion when really it's not even going to get to the 1 billion that he's claimed at the outset is the total amount of humanitarian aid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think that's a problem. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, as long as they keep, as long as they keep that up, if they keep doubling it, it could become very substantial very quickly. So more power hmm. to him. If they're committed to that, listen, as, as even as an ex-Mormon that's very critical, this mm -hmm. is something that I think ought to be really supported and lauded yes. in the church. By the, by the way, that's not, that's not real. So as somebody who's an expert at the, at the roulette table, if I play the Martingale method and I keep doubling down, um, my $5 initial bet within about seven rolls ends up being about 800 bucks. So my well, doesn't it end up being zero pretty quick. My point is that if you keep doubling the amount you give, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you keep doubling the amount of money you give, eventually by the tenth year, the twentieth year, the whatever it is, you are betting way more money than you have in your pocket to give. So that that he can brag about it right now, but you and I and RFM all know within the next few years that statement becomes false pretty quick because you can't keep doing that here right this is what would be really awesome though if they did it if they did it if they for the next four years let's say they doubled it over and over again it means they have to dip into enzyme peak for their yeah. year expenditure that's not once, happening once they let once they open that door a tiny crack mm -hmm. the policy is over this ob obscene absurd policy of never ever spending more than you bring in it's over well, Spencer, yeah. haven't they already opened it twice for well, beneficial life? Sure. And for the mall? Those, Those don't count. I mean, Those I don't mean to rain on your parade or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm giving them credit in advance, but it would be great. It would be great. I would be the first to applaud them. Absolutely. Well, Widow's yeah. Might might be the first to applaud them, but I would I would repeat Widow's, Widow's Might. I'm well, not I'm holding on. My perspective is that there's three reasons why it is the church is increasing their actual humanitarian aid. And those three reasons are widows might report. Yeah, absolutely. You agree Let's with that, Spencer? Right. Really? Tell us about that. I don't know how much detail I can get into that, but oh, I can tell you that the, you 60 minutes, the 60 Minutes producer thinks this as well. Oh, okay. So hmm. Okay, well... Very good. Let's let's play Mr. Waddell saying that. We continue to save and put money aside, and we use it. We will double the humanitarian work again and then again. Very good. Just two more, just two more agains is all we have a guarantee of. I know. That's true. So there's just a double and then another double, and that's it. That's it. And you'll never know if we actually do it because we're not going to tell you. <laughs> Or we'll just add something else in there to make it look like we did when actually we're not, which is what we're doing now. But we're not going to tell you that either. All right, next slide. Okay, here we go. Put it back up. Topic six, we see evidence humanitarian aid is rising sharply. I think we, did we just go over this, Spencer? Yeah, yeah we did. Is there anything on Good. this page or this slide that we haven't just talked about? This is the actual amount of humanitarian aid doubling which is not the billion, it's the 200 million. Oh, I think we covered it. Good. Okay. Because we're uh, now we're in 40 minutes into this, and hopefully we can get done in the next 20 minutes and take a few phone calls. Let's make can that I, our goal. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Real quick question. The Perpetual Education Fund. Um, I don't know how familiar you are or how familiar the Widow's Might folks are, but it seems as though the way that was presented to members, and the only reason I'm saying is because it has the same sort of thing going on mm -hmm. on, a, on a smaller scale. But 
Um, when Gordon B. Hinckley announced it, he talked about essentially like the interest off of these savings would be used. So the perpetual education fund, the way RFM and I thought we were doing it is we were paying into it. I give 10 bucks, RFM gave 10 bucks and the church now took $20 and handed it out to some poor people in another country to go to college, LDS members to go to college and go to school. My understanding is that the actual way it works is that all of us members threw money into the fund and only the interest off the fund is used to put poor LDS students through school and they have to pay it back with interest. So the church doesn't lose anything. It makes money on the interest. It's not risking anything because its principle is always safe. And over the last decade, I have heard almost nothing on the outside. Maybe there's a ton of stuff being said on the poster board inside the chapel hall or the cultural hallway on the other side of the cultural hall. But um, it seems to me that that fund is constantly also growing and only little pieces of the interest are used to help put kids through school meaning that this actually turned into a really deceptive savings account by the church that scammed members into paying money. And that money actually wasn't used to put kids through school, but to create an additional savings account for the church. Yeah. It became super tithing. I'm okay with it being an endowment. I'm sorry, Spencer. What? I I mean, I'm okay with it being an endowment for the future. I don't know if it's not. I don't know if it's true that uh, that it's being used at all nowadays. I haven't heard anything about it, and I also don't know if they had to pay back with interest. That that I can't they remember, did. but they did. So that was yeah. the idea. So that, the that part I don't like. Whole thing that's going to benefit members, and it ends up being a plan. A scheme may be a jaundiced, but a scheme for them to make hundreds of millions of dollars more, which is going to be the corpus of this um, endowment which belongs to the church, then they're going to take the interest from that and they're going to loan that out to uh, young Latter-day Saints who need a helping hand so they can get to college and then pay it back. This is incredible to me that the church makes money off the corpus and then it's going to make money off the interest. The interest. On the backs. (laughs) Everything's on the backs of the Mormons. Yeah, And every time I get involved in finances, I am astonished that it seems the church is consistently concerned more with money than with members. Do you remember when they had way too many Book of Mormons sitting in the warehouse? Don't even, because I did that. <laughs> I bought a hundred of them. It was 1980 freaking five. Yeah, I just I pulled up an article from 1987. Box. I put my... I put my testimony in them. I marked them up with scripture chases. So testimony, handing them out, man. What is this? I I was not alive. Oh, here, I'll show you. This was oh, you the, it, the Family to Family Book of Mormon program. I this, totally uh, this date, it. 1987, the program's already in place. Mm-hmm. Um, here's what happened, Spencer. The church moved on to a new edition of the Book of Mormon. It had um, millions of copies of the old production sitting around. Um, it didn't know what to do with them. So the leaders of the church got together and of course, you know, prophets, seers, and revelators, you come up with inspired programs, the inspired program to get rid of the old stock of the book of Mormon was to challenge every family out of their own funds to purchase multiple books of Mormon, (laughs) and then to give them out to their family and friends, read it as a family, put your testimony into numerous of them, and then pass them out to your neighbors, your friends, your family, anybody else. And the church got rid of all of its old stock of Book of Mormons so that it wouldn't get stuck with them. <laughs> On the backs of the members, those and, bastages. Uh, this happened throughout the 80s. It happened before 1985. Because uh, I bought them, I put them in a backpack, uh, going through the neighborhood. I'm thinking, I'm like Samuel Smith, first missionary. And, uh, you know, my neighbors are going, who's the crazy guy from down the street? And <laughs> then in 1985, it happened again. That's where I got 100 of them again. That's a hundred bucks, right? They're probably a buck each, maybe two. I don't know, 200 bucks, whatever the going rate was for these copies of the Book of Mormon and all the work and passing them out and thinking I'm doing the missionary work. And then that book comes out, which was the Book of Mammon, which is where I heard about this. And I just go, you have got to be freaking kidding me. The church is getting rid of its old worthless to them now copies of the Book of Mormon. It can't sell them. It's come up with a new one. It has its new edition. So we'll have the members buy all the old ones under a 
inspired missionary program. <laughs> That's great. There's, Makes you wonder, does Mary not have to pay for those books of Mormons? <laughs> Do they have in all their hotel rooms? Is that what's going on? Oh, my I, God. I, I bet Brother assume, Marriott got roped into marketing. some of this. Yeah. It's, it's, it is, there is a brilliance to their deception and unethical behavior. Can I say yeah. that I, I feel like the, the LDS Church's primary goal right now is to somehow live up to all the negative stereotypes of Jews and money that have circulated for the last 500 years. And the LDS church is saying, hey, all those negative stereotypes, hold my beer because you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> I'm thinking of doing a new play about it. It's called The Mormon of Venice. All right. I, I don't know what that is, but okay. <laughs> well, it doesn't really exist, to do with but... Jews, I'm not going to be, be there because yeah. I don't want to I don't want to be part of that. But yeah. No, I mean, really. Come on, guys. Okay. So this is uh, topic seven now for this slide. Oh, this is another clip. It's uses of investment funds at Enzyme Peak. How are they used? We've got another clip here between Bishop Waddell. Oh, and a little cameo from David Nielsen in this clip as well. Here we go. Any given month, you may have an average of nine transfers that going from Ensign Peak back to the church to fund all church operations, all humanitarian work, uh, education work, all the work of the church, they fund. Money's going in and out of the cash accounts all the time, but Ensign Peak's funds were never used for any charitable purpose. It's to my knowledge, the whole time I was there. So there's a bit of a distinction here that's important. Explain that to me. Well, it's the difference between your checking account and maybe your retirement account. They're used for different purposes and you don't get to pretend that one is affecting the other. Okay, Spencer, here's my question for you. Why is it that Bishop Waddell is trying to make the audience believe that money is coming out of Enzyme Peak on a regular basis, uh, nine times a month, I think he said, or maybe it was a quarter, that there's this constant flow of money coming out of Enzyme Peak to take care of church bills, when actually that's not true? Because that's the that's the core allegation that David Nielsen is providing, right? Is that nothing's coming in and out of this investment account. So then he suddenly shifts the topic and starts talking about cash accounts, the treasury, which has nothing to do with David Nielsen's allegations, which are that the money in the investment arm of the church is the money's going in and not going out. So it's a little bit weird. I don't know if maybe it was the production team that paired those two things together and made it so that it looked like they were talking about the same thing, or if it was uh, Bishop Waddell that was changing the subject. But in either case, they're talking about two completely different things. Mm -hmm. And this argument that there are that the church is spending cash has nothing to do with the fact that all of this excess tithing that's going into investments is going nowhere after that. It's just building and building and building. It's not coming out. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, well, presuming that this isn't an artifact of infelicitous editing, and it's not 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. it sounds to me like uh, Bishop Waddell is trying to give cover and trying to make it look like there actually is money coming out of Enzyme Peak when there isn't. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Bill? And I should ask just... Spencer as well. Yeah, I'll just say from the business perspective of running the nonprofit here, I have we have a uh, a checking account uh, with Live Oak Bank, and we've got a savings account with Live Oak Bank that earns, as you would expect, more interest than the checking account. Right. And then we have some of our excess funds uh, in a CD. And so um, anytime money gets deposited from donations, it comes into our Live Oak checking account. But I don't want it to sit there. Those are where my expenses are paid. But if I have any over at all, I'm going to stick it over in my savings account so it gets a higher interest rate. And what it seems like is going on is that Waddell wants to play on one half of the truth, which is we have money going in and out of accounts to take care of uh, church operating expenses because we're going to put it over here to get more interest. Now we need it. We're going to put it back over here so we can spend it. And those accounts work very differently. You can't dip into your savings account 
more than so many times a, a month, for instance. You get three transfers or whatever it is. Um, you can't touch CDs. You can't just pull money in and out of the stock market. No big deal. That's that's more difficult. So you're going to move money from whatever account you have that gets a higher interest rate to whatever account your expenses are paid out of. And then you're going to have all your investments, which are less likely to be touched on a regular basis. And he seems to be doing a sleight of hand where he wants you to see one thing he's doing and you to interpret it as he's doing something over here. And, and I think he is being deceptive. What do you think, Spencer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's, it's a little sneaky, right? So he's suddenly shifts the goalpost and he says, you know, like Bill said, there's there's lots of money that's coming in. There's lots of money that has to be shifted around because the church has operations. But there's a whole different, there's an organizational boundary around Enzyme Peak that includes the investments. That's what David Nielsen was working on, the investments, not the treasury. He was working on the investments. He saw money coming in. He didn't see any money going out. And Bishop Waddell did not refute that argument with his argument that there are nine checks right. going out. That's a I have completely another, different issue. I have another question, Spencer. Um, not too long ago, a, a couple of years ago, in fact, let me see if I can just pull it up here really quick. And I'm sorry, RFM, I don't, I, we probably, I probably will keep us from doing this in the time frame we talked about, but. It's okay. Spencer, you don't mind if Bill asks you for a little financial advice, do you? <laughs> Um, all in the middle of the show. risk 2019 to 2021, somewhere in there, the church had two entities. There was the corporation of the president and there's the corporation of the presiding bishopric. Do you remember, do you know what I'm talking about? So yeah. sometime around 2019 to 2021, they merged those. Now, did David Nielsen work for both? He Again, he thinks, again, David Nielsen thinks he's working for the church as a whole. Does he recognize that the church actually was two separate, completely separate companies? And hence, maybe what he was working for was only half of what's represented. And notice, by the way, that from the entry moment of when the church got its hand caught with a cookie jar to the moment where the SEC report comes out. Somewhere in between there, for some reason, the church chose to merge both of its companies into one. Yes, and by and merge, I, I know you mean that it was the, fir the first presidency, or the president. The corporation of the, of the president. Corporation of the president. Mm -hmm. And the corporation of the bishopric. bishopric. Mm -hmm. And then they merged them in the sense of they got rid of the presiding bishopric and now everything is only under the president of the church. It became the corporation of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And for the very first time, did the company actually take on the intellectual property name of the church? So yeah. Do you I don't think know if it makes significance to that Spencer. I don't know if it makes a difference for enzyme peak, but I think that the general tenor of your comment is well taken because the church tends to try and play with the boundaries of these sub organizations and what the organizations truly are. And so the difficulty for Enzyme Peak specifically for the church is that the church created a separate entity. And then from that point forward, it has to prove somehow it's exempt status on its own right. And it defends this by calling itself an integrated auxiliary, right? And you know, I talked to Phil, Phil is the guy's name, the guy who was in 60 Minutes, the, the one who was in uh, the IRS. Uh, Chief counsel. And Chief counsel, that's right. Professor. And to Phil, in order to prove that Enzyme Peak has some function that's within the church, under the umbrella of the church, in order to defend itself as being a nonprofit, have its own exempt status in its own right, it has to have some reciprocal relationship with the church. The problem is, is that David Nielsen is saying that it was a one-way street, not a reciprocal relationship. But it's possible, Bill, that in the last few years, they have restructured simply to put on, you know, think of like 13 shell companies, the way that they did that as well. But it's possible that they've restructured simply for legal purposes so that it seems as though Enzyme Peak is less of a separate entity than it was before. Yeah, and I accept that. But I think there's also room to recognize 
that the church had two separate things. And any time somebody saw something to recognize they were only seeing something from one of the two. Mm -hmm. And it would be highly unlikely that these two separate companies are putting money into the same managed fund, say called Enzyme Peak. And by the way, I'll put up on the screen here. No, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. So, when so you you're saying if, if there were two companies, then they wouldn't have pooled all of the operational no. budget into Enzyme David Nielsen Peak. would have been representing one or the other. He would, have, he would have been aware visually of one or the other. And in the middle of getting caught and getting publicly, it publicly being notified, let me say it differently, between getting caught and the public being notified that you got caught, you took both companies and put them into one and nobody, nobody's following that trail. Nobody's even thinking to ask about that. Yeah. But those are, any moment you saw a glimpse of something going on prior to the merger, you were only seeing one half of what they were doing. Yeah. And I'll just give you an example. Here's uh, exploring Mormonism, structure of the corporation of the president. I want you to see how big Mormonism is. So these are all the holdings. So it gives you a little picture there. Corporation of the president, corporate soul, all assets owned by the president of the church. Um, David O. McKay, corporation of the presiding bishopric, completely separate company. Uh, Desert Management Group. So we can go through here. Beneficial Life, Bonneville International Corporation. Uh, you've got a bunch of radio stations and media companies, Deseret Book, Bookcraft, LDS Missionaries. Um, sorry, that's that's what they're saying. They say serve Deseret Mutual, Hawaii Reserves, Lie Water Company, Lie Treatment Works, Lie Shopping Center, um, the Zion Securities Real Estate, the LDS Foundation, LDS Philanthropies, Deseret Digital Media, Deseret News, KSL, Mormon Times, LDS Church News, FM 100. Um, Deseret Industries, Intellectual Reserve, which manages all the uh, intellectual property of the church. Deseret Ranches, uh, that's multiple ranches, right? Enzyme Peak Advisors, Polynesian Cultural Center, Brigham Young, Brigham Young University, BYU Idaho, BYU Hawaii, LDS Business College in Mexico, Academia Juarez, Preparatoria, Benamitero, Benamarito de las Americas Training Center, Moroni High School, LDS Primary School. You got a bunch of college or a uh, 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 middle schools uh, and high yeah, schools. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, uh, MDU resources, Zion's securities. You got a bunch of other things here. Key Bank Tower, Social Hall Plaza, Beneficial Tower, City Creek Center. You've got 139 East South Temple, JC Penny Building. Uh, here's your residential properties. You got the Brigham Apartments, Colonial Court Apartments, Eagle Gate Apartments, Gateway Condominiums, West Temple Apartments, Garden Apartments, First Avenue Apartments. You got the City Creek Center. You got the Lake Park. Corporate Center, you got the Highbury at Lake Park, you got the Shoal Creek Valley, uh, you got 2% of Florida, Agro Reservist de Bozelle, uh, I don't know where that's at, Deseret Farms, Agro Reservist. Again, I'm not even reading all of these, I'm just zipping through them. The Coela Plantation, Rex Ranch, River Bend Farms. Uh, and do they have farm that massive, massive structure that they just bought in Kent, Washington recently? And they gave a bunch of money to to update a rodeo somewhere here in Utah. Uh, there was a rodeo facility that the church put $14 million into to renovating. Um, LDS Family Services, Property Reserves, Welfare Square. Anyway, that's the church isn't... The religious component is this tiny little piece, and it allows them to shift money around, and if they do it right, there are portions of that money that they don't have to pay taxes on. And again, I'm sure they keep all this separate. I'm sure they follow the rules, except for the fact that we know they don't follow the rules and they don't keep everything separate. Yes, yeah. exactly. Except and it would that. be an interesting question for David Nielsen, but like you said, the it's restructuring could have occurred since then. And so... Yeah, yeah, if Widow's Might is listening, you ought to consider the fact that maybe the church did a sleight of hand and now has... And had you believing you were seeing the whole picture and now it's been merged... So now you think it's like all together anyway, but if you go back in time prior to that merger, you were only seeing half of the business that the church was doing. Right. My understanding is that the only person who can see the whole picture at EP is the general manager and that David actually couldn't see the picture because everything is so compartmentalized. You can only see the parts you're working on yeah. so that you can't see the whole picture. Can't. Yeah. And the stuff that he came into possession of wasn't because he saw the whole picture, but because he saw pieces of paper that had incriminating pieces of information on them, like these two huge, 
payments going out of EP for non-charitable purposes. So Roger Clark, if you're listening, uh, shoot us an email. Let us know. Yeah. Let us know if we are accurate representing both companies total together or whether we're missing half the picture. And that leads me to another question for Spencer, just for clarification's sake, all right? I understand 150 billion ballpark EP investments, but is all the stuff that looks like a church, the temples, the, the stake centers, the ward buildings, all those properties, are those part of EP or are those separate from EP and under a different kind of management system? They're under a different kind of management system. EP's only sur purpose is to control and manage the reserves. Okay, so you've got to actually calculate and add all the other properties together on top of the 150 ballpark for EP in order to come to an approximation of what the real assets of the church are? Uh -huh, which is around $275 billion at this point, I think. Wow. That's more than a quarter of a trillion. That's impressive. Yeah. Mm. So $275 billion is the amount we should remember as the total assets of the LDS church as of 2023? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to sometimes separate them because what is the real value of a temple if you're never going to be able to sell it and it doesn't produce income and uh, like chapels and things like that, BYU's properties, they do operate a little bit differently than some of these for-profit things and maybe shouldn't be counted in the same way. But yeah, if you were to think of that, it that way, if you were trying to put everything under one umbrella, it would be like around two, 275. Well, maybe we what? could be conservative and go to 250. 250 billion, yeah. Billion. Quarter of would you trillion. be comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to remember that for future use. Bill. What if when you build a temple that there is an inside track to the land development in the neighborhoods being built and the houses put on them? And that there's a whole lot more money to be made than just people going to the temple and being more loyal to the church and paying tithing. What if there's also other ways of making... And again, we wouldn't have to ask these questions if there was full transparency. But I'm, I've am i often heard rumors that the top leaders of the church, their children or their grandchildren or their friends who are in those businesses tend to benefit highly from uh, land being developed around the temple. Yeah, so this is one of the allegations, I think, by David Nielsen is private inurement. I don't know how to pronounce that. Private inurement. Yeah, you did just fine. Now, can okay. you explain it for me? Just the idea that the organization is essentially engaging in wealth transfer from the organization itself to family or leadership within the organization. Yeah. Nepotism. Nepotism, yeah. but with cash. Yeah. That's the best yeah. kind. <laughs> Terrell Givens once told me that this was a thoroughly corrupt bureaucracy, and he is right. I mean, I don't, dispute that, I don't Terrell, know what come the, on the show. Is, but, Please, yeah. by all means, Terrell. You're man enough. Yeah. A thoroughly corrupt bureaucracy. Those are your words, Terrell, not ours. Not mine. <laughs> Maven might want to say something. Hi, Maven. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you can speak up just okay. a little bit, but yeah, I can hear you. Um, just uh, attorney Tim Kosnoff, who has done a lot with the Boy Scouts and the sexual abuse scandals, has mm -hmm. is also on record of saying that he, from what he's seen of the church finances, it operates more like a criminal organization than any other church he's ever seen. Well, that's mm -hmm. something to be proud of. Yep. Protect the good name of the church. When you look at the SEC report, do these top 15 guys give one, zero you-know-whats about the good name of the church? Or their good name, for that matter. It is a strange thing when they're dragging the name of the church through the mud and then excommunicating people because they're, what, casting aspersions on the good name of the church? Yeah, by calling people liars when they lie repeatedly. Yeah, that's what hmm. got you in trouble, Bill. Yeah. Meanwhile, I proclaim that none of them are liars. 
None of them are liars. <laughs> Meanwhile, you keep doing episodes showing that they're lying over and over and over, <laughs> over and over and over. <laughs> and over. Yeah, but I don't call them liars, Bill. See? No. That's I, I thought difference. I had a question mark at the end of that episode title. Maybe. I, maybe I left off the question mark. I think huh. that instead of question marks, you followed Wendy Nelson's rule and put exclamation points. The, no, I followed her other rule, the not even once club. Don't do it. <laughs> not even once. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Are there more slides? Yeah, uh, let's put them. We're on. getting to the end of this because we're now at 204. This is topic seven. Enzyme Peak provided two I think we covered distinct this. monetary functions. We went over this. Yep. yep. But this was, this was the next slide. Um, and then there's this one. And that just sort of gives a diagram to make it even more clear where there's the treasury aspect on one side, like the checking account that David Nielsen talked about. Yeah. And on the other side is the investments, which is the EP side, the investments, which is like the retirement account that David Nielsen talked about. East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Yes. Now, another clip. And hopefully we're getting toward the end. I'm sure we must be. This is with uh, Sharon and Christopher Waddell. This sounds an awful lot like an investment bank and they're not paying taxes. It's not an investment bank. It's the church's treasury. It's the church's cash management. Uh, it's the church's bank. They're just holding the assets reserves on behalf of the church as an auxiliary of the church and providing us with those resources that we need in order to operate as a church. So Spencer, he starts off by saying this is not an investment bank, and he ends by saying this is the church's bank. Is there a distinction, or did he, did he just come around at the end to agreeing with what he had disagreed <laughs> with at the beginning? He's having a hard time with synonyms, right? He's like, these things that look like very different to him, nobody else in the world sees them as different. And so, um, yeah, I didn't see like a, a really easy distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an investment bank. It's the church's investment bank. So we're okay. And it, maybe that's what, when, you know, apologists talk about how, like, you know, this isn't just any organization. This is the kingdom of God. I don't know if that's what he was saying. Um, it's not just any investment bank. It's the church's investment bank. Or maybe he was saying, it's not just a regular investment bank. It's the church's investment bank. And therefore, it's under the same protections that the church has. Um, okay. I don't know. All right. I'm as confused as you are on this one. Well, what does uh, Widows might have to say about this particular quote? Okay, let's put it back up. Um, next one. All right. Can you take us through this response, Spencer? Yeah, well, first of all, he says it's, the, it's not an investment bank. It's the church's treasury. But again, he's confusing. The treasury has nothing to do with the investment part. Treasury is the checking even... account, right? You're right. Okay. And it can sound confusing because it sounds like they're putting money back into the treasury from Enzyme Peak. And that's not mm. what's going on. Again, we've talked about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, instead, what David Nielsen's argument has been that they never go out after they've gone in. And... I guess I'm not really certain why this is the slide that comes after this quote, to be honest. Okay. Well, it does um, go on to say that since 1997, per Nielsen's complaint, funds are transferred into Enzyme Peak investments regularly, but have been transferred out only once. We do know that. I think we've right. covered that before. Twice, yeah. Yeah. Um, only twice. I said once. I'm sorry. And the church has never disputed that specific allegation, so we may take it as a verity. Number five, as Waddell clarified later in the 60 Minutes interview, Enzyme Peak's investment reserves were used to do those two things, rescue beneficial life in 2009 and support the City Creek investment in 2010. Okay. So it so sounds does it, like... So yes. does it look like the church's bank? Does it look like it's operating for a church or does it look like it's operating for a for-profit investment firm? And maybe that's what the point of Widow's Might is here, I think, that it's, as far as the evidence points, this is an investment bank. It acts just as much as it like an investment bank that uh, compared to any other investment bank. Yes. It's not the church's investment bank. It's just an investment bank. And now, you know, it's operating as a bank because it has to help out, what was it, uh, Beneficial Life and also City Creek with hefty amounts. But according to Waddell, those aren't 
donations or charitable, those are business dealings where they loaned the amount of money to the recipients under a payment plan with presumably interest that they have to pay off. So yeah, they're acting like a bank. They're giving loans. Of course, they get to choose who they're giving the loans to. So do banks, I suppose. But I think banks have a little bit more regulation as to who they got to give loans to and who they can and who they can't and who they have to. But uh, the churches doesn't have to. So they can give loans to just other arms of the church. They're for profit ventures. They're beneficial life venture under any terms they want. And we don't get to know what those terms are because it's a church and they don't have to be transparent. Do I have that right, Spencer? Oh, you're, you're muted. I'm going to assume you agreed with me. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. and just, just to note it. too, I mean, this is where the, according to the slide, it's from this Enzyme Peak Fund that the church leaders are paid, uh, that they get their stipend, allowances, benefits. And That's so true. by... By opening up the tran by being transparent about the Enzyme Peak Fund, we would all get to see what these guys really make when you add it all up together. We've all heard rumors, right? And again, not a, it's not exactly false. Grant Palmer had a conversation with a seventy Enzio Bushy, and if we trust a uh, former general authority Enzio Bushy, he said that every one of these guys gets a million dollars on the front end to pay off debts. Again, according to Grant Palmer's conversation with him. Mm -hmm. uh, that they get a million dollars to pay off debts, almost certainly sign some sort of NDA, and uh, and then have a, and I've also heard rumors that they have a slush fund that they all get to whenever they have a need, they can just go do what they want, and that's above and beyond their standard living stipend. And again, I could be off. They could clear it all up if they would just be transparent. Right. I think that's what the treasury is, Yeah, is in effect a slush fund. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. By the way, uh, by the way, Spencer, I've got to ask you: If is this idea about the salaries? Uh, is it like how much is it roughly? Is it three hundred million a year in salaries for all the GAs and everything? I think it's even just thirty million. It's nothing. It's not million. much. Okay, I think so it was like two hundred thousand or something per. The and, uh, widows might did an analysis, and I think that they figured the total benefits, which some of which are not cash, were around two hundred fifty thousand per year per person i could be off on that okay and that makes sense because i think that's about right to where it would be so if you're a, an apostle you're making about two and a half uh excuse me two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in compensation whether it's monetary or other benefits mm -hmm. is there any benefit to taking that compensation package for all the gas out of the ep ep fund instead of just the treasury why don't they just take it out of the treasury like they see do this is what's else? really weird right so back and forth we've seen the church describe ep's funds as for profit therefore not sacred tithes and then other times like for example in the 60 minutes interview they're very clear that these are sacred tithes right mm -hmm. that they're they're going to take care of enzyme peak funds because they know that where they've come from and therefore that they are, you know, they're, they're taking the utmost care of, they have like professionals that are dealing with it. Right. So they're on one hand, they're saying, you know, these are the church's tithe funds. And then on the other side that they'll, they'll say, you know what, we're not using tithe funds for this thing. And in this instance with the salaries, I think that they've used EPA's, funds so that they can say no tithes are used to pay for general authority salaries. So they can say it's just coming out of the interest component of the EP account and not the tithing that they use to make the interest. As if there's a difference. Yeah, it's pretty fungible. Economically, there isn't. No. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding right, there's a difference here. Now, this is like loose translation of the Book of Mormon versus tight translation. Could you be both. make an argument when tight translation benefits you. And then you make a different argument when loose translation benefits you, but you can't make them both together, right? Because then yep. it goes, boom, they're contradictory. Yeah. It sounds like you're saying the church describes the EP account as tithing when it benefits them, when they want that protection for the money in the account, the $150 billion. But when they don't want that protection 
and they don't want to appear to be using tithing, say for beneficial life or for the mall, then they describe it as not tithing. That's Do right. I have that right? Yep, that's right. Hmm. It's a it's a loose accounting versus a tight accounting. <laughs> the way that we would call it. <laughs> Yeah, Nephi's Egyptian, but horses could be tapers. That's right. Yes, we can redefine things. Well, yes. Okay, so do we have another slide? All right. I'm is, so excited now. Is this the one we just had up? I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, yes. Yes, that's the one we just had up because it had the general authorities pay. Okay. Oh yes, this is when the uh, Sharon Alfonsi asks, "When does prudent become excessive?" When it's might you answer. have too much money? What is enough years that you could possibly have? And the answer is never. We could never <laughs> have enough money. Never. <laughs> He's almost gleeful. You ready? But this is how he puts Ooh. it. These are the words he uses. Here we go. When we use it. Ooh, let's try this. We continue to save and put money aside, and we use it. Ooh, that can't be right. Let's try this again. We can. Oh. Sorry, which clip is it supposed to be? I'll get it up. Well, it I'm not is, actually sure right now. It's the one where he is asked, when does prudent become excessive for oh, the church? Okay. Um, I don't know if it's ever becoming excessive. I thought I put excessive. that one up. So That's I fine. think if this one isn't it, then I might not have saved it correctly. Um, okay. Well, that's yeah, okay, because if you haven't, I think we've established a track record of quoting them correctly, or it would have might have. <laughs> Somebody so, is transparent and accurate and uh, honest, yes. So if we can just put that slide back up, that's fine. Yep. We'll just read the slide. But notice, there's never too much. Enough is never enough. And this is the allure. This is the danger of money. Because once you fall into its trap, and thank God I've really never had the... Um, the opportunity to succumb to that particular temptation but once you do you are sucked in and this is why the new testament talks about money the love of money being the root of all evil once you go into there you can never have enough and you are like scrooge mcduck taking the half gainer off the side of the boat into the sea full of gold coins and swimming around in them so sharon asks christopher waddell when does prudent become excessive which is a nice way of saying, when is enough too much, right? And Bishop Waddell says, for the church, um, I don't know if it's ever becoming excessive. Wow. No, he didn't say wow. I'm saying wow. I don't know if it's ever becoming excessive because it's all going to be used at some point. What the hell does that even mean is what I'm asking. That means it's if you have... It's all going to be used at some point? Why if you is that? have... 800 years of tithing saved up of, of, of you've got so much money. It's 800 years worth of operating expenses. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that it still can never become excessive because it'll That's be used at say. some point. It will all be used at some point. But if you follow the policy that you have followed for over 20 years now, the policy is it's never going to be used at any point at all. That's the whole they, point of the policy. They said it was a rainy day fund. We've had, housing market crashes Kaboom. we've had recessions um they're not using it they're not a using matter it of a, a two-year worldwide pandemic that went virtually unnoticed by anybody except for a few people and that apparently did not qualify as a rainy day sufficient to unleash or loosen up some of the money mm -hmm. in this ep account and if those things if a worldwide pandemic and housing market crash and recessions are not sufficient to loosen it up and get some money, even $1, out of this EP account, I'm not sure what is going to qualify as a rainy day. And it should be noted here, the idea that you and I have always been given RFM is that we need some money for when Jesus comes back, that the second coming is going to happen. Mm -hmm. As you and I have talked about, the church has now changed its narrative that we are in the beginning of an ongoing restoration, it's early which days. means we are, we are 200 years in. And at this moment, we're in the beginning of an ongoing restoration, which means they have admitted that Jesus isn't coming back 
for at least another 400 years. I say 400 because once you get past being a third of the way into something, you couldn't describe it as being in the beginning. To be in the beginning, you'd have to be in the first portion of that time period. And we're already 200 years in and we're still in the beginning. So we certainly have at least 400 more years before Jesus comes back. Imagine how much we'll have saved by then. That would be a lot. That would be, they're, they're estimating. Widow's Might is estimating a trillion dollars by 2050, is it? 2040? Yeah. 2048, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, so um, possibly within my lifetime. It's not a huge stretch. It could happen. But <laughs> a trillion dollars. Can yeah. you imagine a trillion dollars? That's just amazing. How much would they have in 350 more years or 400 more years or 500 more years? Well, more and more and more, and it's compounding. That's the yeah. beauty of compounding. It's also the beauty yeah. of uh, not being taxed on it. And it's yeah. also the beauty of having like a billion dollars you can throw in there every year just to keep yeah. things going. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if the church and the restoration were a car, President Nelson, because, you know, it used to be it's the 11th hour. Jesus is yeah. coming back any second. Then it's 1130. Then it's 1145. And now it's 2 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, and now it's 2 a.m. in the morning. If it were a car, it's like President Nelson went into the car and he rolled back the odometer. Yeah. A little metaphor that apparently didn't go over very well. No, no, no. You're right. Well, I was, expecting, I was expecting a metaphor to have gone in 60 seconds when you started mentioning a car. Oh, so dang, yes. Head. By the way, uh, three words about that movie, Blonde, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> You know, you don't see that in every movie. Right. And Nicolas Cage back in his heyday. You know what this uh, quote reminds me of is uh, The Hobbit. I'm going to nerd out for a minute. Uh oh. When they're describing dragons and smog, it talks about how they are. They so I looked something up. Okay, so it says by their very nature they relished not only the theft of beautiful things but the act of dispossession itself. It was more satisfying for them to steal treasure from others than to find unclaimed valuables. Um, they had a very keen sense of the value of their hoard. The reasons behind their strong affinity for gold are unknown, but dragons often put a greater priority on possessing gold than on obtaining food, and they can survive without food and maybe water as well for decades or perhaps even centuries. This suggests that jewels may be the primal sources of, of the great serpent's life forces though they could also simply possess extremely slow metabolism similar to the other reptiles, but exaggerated. So it's basically saying, you know, they love gold just for the sake of having the gold. There's no use for it. They're not actually creating it because these are passive investments for the mm, most part. You say that, but let's, let's make the assumption that there would be a lot of nepotism in a system. Could you see how having enough money to last far beyond your own lifetime might be a value if if there were a significant amount of nepotism. If. Sure, yeah. I would yeah, argue that fair. they are creating it. Um, I mean, just by all the, the things they do with the members, with the tithing requirement, especially connected to temple blessings, uh, all the money they save by, you know, having fired the janitors and making that a calling, you know, plus having members do it. And then a, a lot of free labor from missionaries, both young and old, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I mean... I'm just kind of maybe nitpicking here, but I think it's not, I mean, the interest being earned is passive, but the efforts gone to get the principal in, I think, and, and really honestly fleece the members is pretty massive. You mean like and telling while, the saints in Africa that if they paid their tithing, they get out of poverty, like that kind of thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, I put this in the chat, but I just totally remembered this, from my childhood, the Disney movie, and if I if we could play the clip, I mean, this might be demonetized anyway because of the CBS clip, so yeah. it might be worth it. But uh, if I had it on hand, but the the older movie, one of you know Disney's uh, early early ones, uh, Robin Hood, there is a scene where the friar is in the church. It's a rainy day, nobody's coming to church because uh, it's you know rainy and the people are really taxed to death just about anyway there's a scene where the the church mice feeling bad that there's nothing in the donation box bring out their last little farthing and they say they're saving it for a rainy day which 
also just like rainy day fun kind of stuff. But anyway, the friar is very touched by that. He takes this meager donation, puts it in the poor box. And then, of course, who comes by but the sheriff of Nottingham. And so uh, he opens that poor box, sees that one farthing, and he takes it. And the friar gets extremely angry, saying, that is for the poor. And the sheriff of Nottingham says, well, I'm just going to take it for poor Prince John. And he does. And uh, the friar getting upset about, you know, ends up getting him arrested. And I just feel like, boy, that scene really, I think, really encapsulates exactly what's happening in the church. It's It really is exactly that. The church is the sheriff of Nottingham. That's yeah. my comment. And maybe yeah. let me go ahead and follow that up because I think all these insights are great. And I like the idea also about the very act of dispossession is as gratifying to a dragon as it is to hoard and sit on and protect mm -hmm. and luxuriate in all the wealth and the gold and the gems. But I'm going to throw it out there as a possibility, mm -hmm. okay? Let's say for argument's sake that in 1997, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was still the restored, true, and living Church of God upon the face of the whole earth. Even if we assume that we're true, I think there's an argument that could be made that it has become so corrupted by its wealth in fulfillment of many promises and predictions in the New Testament that it could no longer be true today. Mm. Yeah. I think that's fair. Certainly, certainly since the unethical behavior that we read in the SEC report, it would be hard to imagine prophets, seers, and revelators actually being in tune with the Holy Ghost and being visited by Christ or hearing his voice when they committed uh, a degree of financial fraudulent behavior, behavior over and over and over again. Yeah, and they're not lying to the Nazis to hide the Jews hiding upstairs in the attic. No, All they're it's not doing a good is line. lying to the federal government in order to hide how much money they have because they're worried the members won't keep paying tithing if they find out. And they're lying to the members whose money it was in the first place. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> By the way, let me say this because I know the church always says these are sacred funds. We treat them with great sacredness. You know, they're so dang special. We pray over them all the time to make sure that we're doing the right thing with them. And yet, that attitude, if we take it as sincere, leads to this kind of corruption that we're talking about. I think that if you took a different attitude toward that money and you said, hey, we're not going to look at it as the Lord's money. We're going to look at it as the member's money, which they have sacrificed in order to give to us. And we need to use that money for the benefit of the members who gave it to us in the first place then you would have a completely different outcome and a completely different way of looking at things that I think would be more in har harmony with God's will than looking at the money as God's money in the first place. Right. Your thoughts, Spencer? Yeah, that's why it's called the Widow's Might Report. It's the lens by which we could view those funds. The, that's a lot of Widow's Mites out there, billions and billions of Widow's Mites. Um, can, I, can I clarify something too by this quote here? Please. Sharon says, when does prudent become excessive? And of course, she's talking about the church. She's talking to the guy that's representing the church. And he says, for the church? Um, why does he clarify that? Do you have any idea? Um, they may have been having some discussion before about personal things, or I don't know. Because I don't know if there had been a conversation about, we encourage members to do this, that, and the other thing. It and then be. she comes up with this question shortly thereafter, and he may have a legitimate question. Are you talking about the members or for the church? Yeah, I think That's I have an answer to that. And I'm sorry oh, for leading you. A leading question here. But in general conference, Bishop Waddell said this. He, he said, church leaders have often encouraged Latter-day Saints to prepare for adversity in life by having a basic supply of food and water and some money and savings. And here's the key point. At the same time, we are encouraged to be wise and not go to extremes in our efforts to establish a home storage supply and a financial reserve. So he's saying, don't go out of, don't go too crazy with your financial mm -hmm. reserves as a person, as an individual. And don't be like us. Wait a don't minute. Be like he's, us. he's telling members not to go to an extreme in a financial reserve. That's right. In general no, conference. Which is also, by the way, horrible advice. 
Every human being out there, if you have the means to save money, you should save a lot of it. I Life, mean, the, the back 20 years is going to be a lot different than the current 20. You can become you can become excessive in your wealth. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the church has proved that. Yeah. So I think as a person, you could become excessive, but don't go to Kettle, extremes. Pop. Sure. But Use I don't your think imagination, the Bill. It could happen if you think about it. <laughs> Here's the church with $150 billion, 27 years of operating expenses saved up, not including interest yet to be earned on that money. And it's telling its members who have the lowest, the, the ninth lowest amount of money saved up for retirement, not to get excessive about their retirement savings. Right. Right. Except it's the lowest. Well, it depends mm -hmm. on which one you look at, but yeah, either at lowest or ninth. At least the lowest. ninth, maybe the lowest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Seems like great advice. Kettle. Well, it's very pot. good advice. Yeah. What'd you say? That's why I think he kettle? clarified there. Yeah. I think that's why he clarified. Because he knows beans. that he's given advice out there about avoiding excessiveness. Yeah. Let me separate because it's the whole idea. We do not give apologies. But yeah. you, when you repent, you should make it right with the person that you've offended. Like right. there's a double standard all along the way. Is there a part in his talk where he says, we're going to make it easy for you not to be excessive in your, your savings by taking all of your discretionary income as well as time? We keep That's you from having excessive savings. We take it and we create what excess, excessive savings. It'll help you're you welcome. with your budgeting. <laughs> and, then, one of the and then when you have needs, now, now you're 60 years old and you go to your bishop and you say, Bishop, I just don't have any money. And I've paid tithing all my life. And what's the bishop? He's taught to you go, go ask your family, go do this, go work at the storehouse. Go to the government now. They changed yep. that recently. Yeah. And, and so the last person you ask is the person who's been holding all of your money all along. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really wrong. And if it weren't the Lord's church, nobody would stand for it for a second. Yeah. Next yeah. slide. Okay. We can run through these ones quick, I think. Yay. Because there's 11 topics total. What does this uh, slide let me, tell us? Yeah, let me get rid of that. Spencer. This one tells us the church has a whole lot of money. <laughs> and it it's looks growing excessive. even faster and faster. It looks like a billion. tsunami of money. This is a good bell curve. Yeah. It's a blue wave. It's a tidal wave. Yeah. It's coming in off the North Shore. Yeah. That's okay. good, right? Yep. This, oh, one again, says, this is another slide. Is it showing us the same thing or what? It's just, yeah, it's going to grow so much. It's going to have any more money and it's already excessive. Yeah, it's guessing based on six, seven or eight percent returns. Again, a, a really conservative interest rate right now that would be easy to get would be four percent, um, which I also think is the rate of inflation at the present moment. So putting it in the stock market wisely ends up with something higher than that. And so I think even this is relatively conservative. Mm -hmm. So that 1,000, these are in billions. So that 1,000 mark is actually 1 trillion, correct? Yeah, 1,000 billion. 1,000 billion. So mm -hmm. that predicts what year it will hit 1 trillion depending upon the rate of increase. And basically it's either 2,042, 44, or possibly if things are really bad, the church will have to wait until 2054 to have a trillion dollars. Mm. And that Am number- the graph correctly? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. And look okay. at that curve. That This only gets worse. I mean, the and better for them, by the way. Yes, but better, <laughs> better, Bill. But this, this grows exponentially. It, it doesn't, it's not a, a standard rate of growth. It's that you constantly are compounding essentially the interest mm -hmm. um, because you're adding more money and you're collecting more interest. And this curve gets sharper and sharper in an upward direction. It's like playing roulette, but in the reverse. And you're paying your investors slave wages. Yeah, most of them are volunteers clearing, cleaning the shitter on Saturday. Oh, and I mean the investors, the investment the managers. Oh, I got you. They're gotcha. being paid paying way them. below what they would be totally. paid pretty much anywhere else in any private uh, firm. Uh, I thought you were talking about the like forty something to maybe seventy thousand dollars starting or something like that. So it's not really slave wages, but it's substantially less than the going rate. So they got low overhead, they got no taxes, they got a billion dollars coming in every year to add to the kitty. And this curve is what happens when all those three things come together. It's like a perfect storm. Volunteer workforce. I mean, the, the assistants in the mission office that are the senior, the senior assistants, 
Those are all just senior missionaries called to serve in a mission office. Uh, Bishop Storehouse, a lot of those are volunteer uh, people called on missions. Uh, mo- a lot of the church's workforce is mm-hmm. either underpaid or not paid at all. I think I, I know how they're going to be staffing all these temp- temples they're building, staffing and having people go through. Yeah. Animatronics. <laughs> we'll see. Disney is going to save the temples. Okay, next one here. Like the Hall of Presidents. I mean, I'm just picturing how creepy the temple is going to be with like these like Disneyland ride animatronic. Oh, it's going to be great. <laughs> you're going to be in a boat so and you're going to be going through <laughs> and the temple workers will be singing, you know, it's a pirate's life for me. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people go. A lot more will go, I think. Yeah. Well, okay, so true. topic nine is a bulwark compared to the wealthiest institution. So this is where they compare how much the church has in Enzyme Peak with other large endowments. Who's that really big one there? Who has the big endowment? It's Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, oh okay. Yes. So it's a big investment firm, right? The largest. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only one that has more than Enzyme Peak. It's not the yeah, only class. one. It's not the only one, but it is the largest and it's around half the size, which I think is still pretty substantial. Yeah, yeah, their apparently. class A shares are like three thousand bucks, and their class B shares are three hundred and forty-eight dollars a share, or something like that. Yeah, and I remember one of the um, the responses, one of the apologetic responses, that is how much Enzyme Peak has compared to Harvard, and and which is one of those blue lines, right. and to Yale, which is another one of those blue lines, and just say, well, if you put Yale and Harvard together, they have almost as much as Enzyme Peak. So you know, <laughs> what's the difference? It's amazing the places the human mind will go in order to justify and rationalize your beliefs. One of the one of the apologetic arguments was, well, when you take all the BYU system, the BYU education systems together, they actually have so many more students than Harvard does that on a per student basis, it doesn't have as much as Harvard. Well, the difference is Harvard actually uses it as an endowment. Enzyme Peak isn't using it for anything. So it, it it's a it's completely absurd argument here. Mm, yeah. right. It's only if we were to compare these that we would say if it were an endowment, then would this be large? But yeah. This is one of the reasons I'm so glad we have you on, Spencer, is because you can give us these insights, which I don't know, and I think most of, most people who aren't involved in this know, but when you explain it, then you go, oh, well, that's completely different. And I wouldn't have known that except for your explaining it. So thank you for being here and doing that. Thanks for having me on. This is great. By the way, I just want to notice Dan Hardy's making comments. Dan Hardy always watches these streams from one of the Facebook groups so yeah. that he doesn't have, I, I'm guessing, so that he doesn't have to deal with the chats of the people in the YouTube channel because he basically isolates himself so that his comments get to go to us. We get to see them. Oh. But then everybody in the YouTube uh, doesn't get to see them unless we put them up on the screen. I yeah. would invite Dan Hardy to watch this on YouTube and to see if your arguments, which I think are actually extremely weak, uh, make any sense to a bunch of people who uh, are educated and informed and disagree with you. Well, can I just say that I'm glad Dan Hardy is watching and commenting At anywhere all. because yeah. I like Dan. I think he's a yeah. good guy. He, he is looks a great guy. in those tailored shirts, too. Yes, he does. Chef's kiss. So. <laughs> Oh, there's another quote that maybe we'll play and maybe we won't. But this is Bishop Waddell saying, we will continue to build temples that require those resources and the maintenance of those temples. Now, go ahead and get that ready. But the main thing about this quote is, when I heard this said, by the way, by the way, everybody, this is something that is not in the part that was aired on Sunday. Bill, is this the first one from the... Additional so material. I, I don't know that. that. I don't know that, but Maven has it ready to go. Okay. Well, go ahead and play that. It looks the same, but there is a certain amount that was aired as part of the piece. Yeah. And then at 60 minutes at their Facebook page and probably at other places they have, we went to their Facebook page. They have additional pieces of the interview that they weren't able to put into the part they aired. So it's still Bishop Waddell on the record, just in a part of the interview that didn't get aired on 60 minutes. Yeah, the program. Uh, they, they, I think they call it 60 Minutes Overtime or something like that. Yeah, 60 Minutes Overtime. And when I saw this, I was thinking, what are you talking about? Because he was making it sound as if the money for the temples, 
and the resources and the maintenance. Once again, he's trying to get this impression it's coming out of Enzyme Peak. When I know it's not, it's coming out of the Treasury. It's coming out of the check account. They'll never There's spend more than they take in. Yeah. And they've got tons and tons of money. With that extra billion dollars that's incoming that they don't use to pay their regular bills, do you know how many temples a billion dollars will buy? A lot. A lot. Yeah. It's a thousand million dollars. So they have plenty of money to do whatever it is they want to do without ever touching EP. And we know that they will never touch EP. And before they ever touch EP, they will cut back their expenses. But here's the quote from Bishop Waddell. Again and then again, we will continue to build temples that require those resources and the maintenance of those temples. There we go. Any comments about that, Spencer? And you're muted right now, but now you're not. Thank you. Well, I mean, they like you said, they're not using those resources to build temples. They don't need to. Widows might already did an analysis on this, and they found that they could, and I think this is the next slide, but you could actually get to 1,000 temples by 2040 and never touch Enzyme Peak funds. So Okay, so let's I, repeat that. Out of the billion dollars they have left over that usually just goes into Enzyme Peak at the end of every fiscal year, with a billion dollars by 2040, the church could build a thousand temples, a thousand new temples, or have a thousand total temples. Get to know? a thousand temples by 2040, and that incorporates their maintenance costs as well. Because I know he mentioned the maintenance of those temples, so you, you don't have to dip into Ensign Peak. So when people say like, "Oh, well, you know, the the all of these funds are for operations of the church. It's for the future operations of the church." Well, you could like grow the church by almost three times. And you're still not dipping into it. You're still not dipping into, I mean, because look at the how many temples there are right now. There are only 226 committed. You could get to 1,000 constructed and get to, and you still wouldn't touch Enzyme Peaks funds. In 17 years. In 17 years. Get to 1,000 temples. You never dip into Enzyme Peak. And all of this effort that Bishop Waddell is going through, and he was severely prepped to do this to try and deceive the listener into thinking that these are amounts that are being funded by Enzyme Peak is all a smoke screen. Mm. Right. Okay. So, next, next slide. Last one. Yay. Okay. So here's the last, by the way, there have been several of these quotes. They may sound new to you if you only watched the part that aired. So the last five quotes or so, are from the separate piece at 60 minutes overtime, which is stuff that went on the cutting room floor, but was preserved on their Facebook page. So we have this last one. This is called Secrecy and Trust. This is the final clip we have between Sharon Alfonsi from 60 Minutes and Bishop Waddell. And Maven, do you have that one? I just don't see it available to us. I can try to grab it from a different spot. Okay, I think she's getting it. Well, I will say that um, Sharon first off asks, let me know if you ever, if you find it. Church yep, members we we've spoken to talk about an erosion of trust because of the secrecy. Is there any discussion about regular disclosure of what's happening with church finances? Bishop Waddell responds, no. There's no more discussion about disclosing the value of the totality of the resource at Enzyme Peak. And Sharon follows up with, because, and he says, because it's confidential. Damn it, Sharon. Haven't you been paying attention to anything I've been saying? <laughs> no, he says, because it's confidential. And we do, again, disclose and announce the building of temples. I mean, what are you complaining about? We give you some information. You know, when you, when you kind of get a grip or a grasp on what's going on behind the scenes, his answers start to become patronizing and even insulting. <laughs> Because it's confidential, and we do, again, disclose and announce the building of temples. We do announce missionary work. I mean, what do you say we're not transparent for, Sharon? We do share what we're doing with humanitarian work. Nah, I think that's where he went a bridge too far on that one. Anyway, what he's telling us there in the highlighted portion is that, no, I'm not going to tell you how much we have right now, and I'm never going to tell you, Sharon. We're not even talking about the possibility of ever telling you. Because it's and not going to happen. We are committed to secrecy. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bill, what? 
I was just going to say, here it is. I have talked about an erosion of trust because of the secrecy. Is there any discussion about regular disclosure of what's happening with church finances? No, there's no more discussion about disclosing the, 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 the value of the, the totality of the resource at Ensign Peak. Because? Uh, because it's, it's confidential. Um, and we do, again, disclose and announce the building of temples. We do announce missionary work. We do share what we're doing with the humanitarian work. That's peanuts con compared to the whole thing. It's nothing. It's like telling you that I bought a candle and meanwhile I've got $40,000 sitting on the side that you want to know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to ask for Spencer's take on this, but I'm just going to say that I've noticed something interesting about our friend. Bishop Waddell is that every time he started to get in trouble and he starts feeling the pressure, he strangely stops looking at Sharon and he breaks the fourth wall and looks at the camera. Have you noticed that? Whenever he starts to get in trouble, he goes like, he's like looking at the audience going, okay, help. Can somebody help me a little? <laughs> breaks the fourth wall. You know, if you play that thing again, you'll see what I'm talking about. I know it's late. It's 245. So don't go, go back and look at it later if you care. Okay, yeah. but I've noticed this throughout. Every time he gets in trouble, he starts looking at the camera. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm doing okay, but now I'm getting in trouble. Now I'm getting in trouble. Okay, now I'm back to doing okay. <laughs> Some people have a tell, don't they? Oh, this is a huge tell. I'd love to play yeah. poker with this guy. Yeah. Um, okay, any, I guess there's one other slide. No limits, this. obviously. Uh, until 1959, the church disclosed key financial data. By the way, somebody mentioned the very beginning of the show in a comment, the church didn't have a good track record then. Like, why should we trust them? They were completely broke, had mishandled funds. Mm -hmm. And now they're on the other side where they're saving so much money, way more than they could ever use. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like they don't understand balance. Uh, they're either completely broke and, and having to think about selling off church property or they're so wealthy that they've got enough money to last uh, three or four more messiahs. They are rich as Croesus. Yeah. Okay, that's the last one, I believe. Nope, there's just the resources. Yeah, those the are the sources. sources. Yep. All right, so Bill and Spencer, bring it home. Okay. You want, to go, first? You want me to uh, go? go ahead. Either way, let me go first, Spence, because you're the expert in this field, so you get the closing closing word, and and we'll take a few phone calls after. Um, when I look at the church with the Book of Mormon thing we talked about earlier, the Perpetual Education Fund, all of the holdings the church has, the merging of the corporation of the president and the bishopric, uh, again, I'll go back to the quote I shared earlier. What is the risk of being understood to be dishonest and deceptive in hiding things? Whatever that risk is, it is judged by them to be less risky than telling the truth. These guys don't want to be honest. They don't want to be transparent. And it seems that in the modern moment, 2023, that we as a people collectively are deeply valuing those things. And this thing, at the risk of its members seeing it as dishonest, um, the SEC report, as being seen as deceptive, Waddle here talking to 60 Minutes, it, it seems that they are perfectly okay with losing the member's trust and being seen as unethical because whatever the alternative is, is worse for them than that. Yeah, and I'm not sure it's a good strategy to be relying on members trusting the church leaders right after they've gotten exposed for being untrustworthy. Unless knowing the truth, unless the church said, okay, fine, here it all is. Unless knowing that would be worse. Yeah, I know you're digging for something and it may exist and it certainly has a lot <laughs> of signs that would be consistent with what it is that you are insinuating. But don't you think though that, again, I'm using conjecture, but don't you think that all evidence that we have points to something bigger being hidden away that they don't want us to know? It's either that, Bill, or the culture of secrecy in the church. And dishonesty. The culture of secrecy in the church. <laughs> Sorry. Words deep. In 
and so long and since the very beginning that they don't they can't see it in any other way they don't even yeah. tell bishop they won't they won't even tell people who the heck the next bishop is going to be or even a lower calling until it's announced in front of the the media everything's supposed to be so secret in this church this may just be a continuation of that and then there's a tension with the government which the church has always had a, a tough time with i mean since the beginning and certainly during polygamy etc there's been more of a raw approachment in, in the last few decades but still it runs deep and i think that trying to get the church to be transparent is like trying to teach an old dog new tricks yeah case bents yeah so i guess my overall takeaway was a little bit different than than what we've talked about so far but if you go to the Facebook page on 60 Minutes, not a Mormon page or anything like that, and you take a look at the comments from the general audience to get an idea of what the non-Mormon audience thought of this, mm -hmm. you read over and over and over again. They're not surprised that the church does this. They're mad about it. But they see this as a systemic problem and a societal problem wherein they cannot trust the religious institutions in this country and they can't trust the country's laws or the lack of enforcement in those laws. Um, and they see that as a contributor to that lack of trust as well. So this is potentially a much bigger movement than Enzyme Peak or the church than, than what, you know, what, in our little bubble of the church. And so legally, who knows, you know, I don't know whether Enzyme Peak will end up getting hit for this or the church in general in terms of losing its tax exempt status. I find it unlikely that they would lose their tax exempt status. Maybe Ensign Peak would. But you can do a few things because here's the thing. You have a lot of people behind you more than just the ex-Mormons or the former Mormons um, in terms of trying to make a difference here. But you know, we know already that we can't trust the church to be transparent and to do the right thing. We know that we can't necessarily trust the IRS to force the church to do the right thing. And so what we have to do as a general populace is go to legislation. So you can contact the Senate Finance Committee, tell them that you want to pursue them to pursue an investigation into the church and the laws that permit the church to act that way. And there are smaller things that you could do. There are things that we could do that we could get together and, and you know help co-sponsor bills. So for example, the church files a Form 990T but they don't file the Form 990 that's supposed to go with the Form 990T. Religious organizations are the only ones that can do that. And it's what weird. What is the significance of that, Spencer? The Form 990 is for all charitable organizations um, in order to keep their tax exempt status, they have to file a Form 990 every year. And what that Form 990 has is basically a balance sheet. It basically provides the assets of the entity. Now, the only organization that is exempt from for filing a form 990 that is tax exempt is a religion. So religions don't have to file it for whatever reason. But what's really weird about that is there there's an appendage to the 990 called the 990T if you have unrelated business income that you have to pay taxes on. So the church for years has been filing a 990T that refers back to a 990 that doesn't exist. It's completely illogical part of the of the tax code. It's a very narrow piece of code that could be changed. And what would happen is you would enforce more transparency. All you've got to do is pass a law that says, if you have a 990T, you got to file a Form 990. Okay. There are little things like this that we could do. And it, that, I think, is the avenue for change with the church. It's not to, it's not to call your bishop. It's not to uh, clearly, right? Um, Sign it's petition. not to hope that the IRS will do something. Mm -hmm. it's, it has to be through legislation. The IRS itself is a politically influenced organization. Tax law is passed by Congress. Right. So we have to get political um, in order to make a change here. That's what I got to say. Sorry if I, I'm not a political person, but I think that this is one area where it has to get that way. Yeah. Okay. Do so you guys want to take a couple phone calls? Yeah, let's take a couple phone calls. And if they're ready to go, the irony, yeah. of course, is that we had thought this will be about an hour and we'll just take a bunch of phone calls. And now it's been two hours and 53 minutes. So we'll take, yeah. you know, half a phone call, maybe yes. three. 
Okay, here we go. So the first one is uh, Juanita, I believe. Is that correct? Hello? Caller? Oh, let me, I, it's my fault. Let me push one more button here. Let's try it again. Juanita, Hi. are you there? I'm here. Perfect. Go ahead. Can you? Yeah, yeah. You're on well, Mormonism I, Live. I just, I just loved what um, Spencer was saying. And also on that 990, they would have to disclose the officers and wages compensation each year. So that's something that they would definitely not want to do because they would have to disclose that. And then also, I think when you guys talk about the um, donations and the humanitarian aid, we're forgetting about the in-kind that they are they are calculating on there. So like when I was growing up, they'd say, hey, we're doing this thing. We're going to send blankets up to the the thing or we're going to send these kits up to the things but the members had to pay for all the stuff we would send up there they're counting that as income from their in-kind income but they're also counting that as their um that humanitarian aid so that's not actual money coming out of the coffers that's money coming out of the members accounts yet again to put that in there so those were my two things i wanted to say thank you Anita. yeah thank you very much what do you think about that spencer uh, she's right. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it's almost that the church has, um, I don't know, it's like they've become masters at manipulating statistics, whether it's the membership of the church or the amount of donations the church is making to humanitarian aid. These guys are masters. It reminds me of a Radio Free Mormon episode titled Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. Yeah, parts one, two, and three. Yeah. That's a lot of lies. <laughs> and statistics here is i believe justin justin are you there yes i am can you hear me yeah you're on mormonism live my friend okay hey i had a quick question uh, and i'll you know up front i'm an active mormon and this stuff is all really always hard to hear i've been listening to a lot of podcasts about that but what i was curious about and something i haven't heard talked about kind of two questions no one has really said what this means going forward. Will it continue to go the way it's been going? Like when we talk about becoming a trillion dollar company, does that mean we're going to have a hundred shell companies or the SEC fine? Does this say, you now have to redefine and do everything different or we will, will we just be dealing with fines every year until whenever? For, can I ask you a question? With, oh. Can I ask you, as a you know, as a believing, active, faithful Latter Day Saint, does hearing how much money they make, hearing the unethical actions they took to create the shell companies and to perpetuate that whole thing, does it bother you at all? Like, are, is this is this causing some concern in you about the leaders of your church? Um, me personally. Um, I've, I've worked in a lot of businesses and I, I understand a little bit of accounting. So I, I understand the idea of shell companies is not always a scandalous thing. And this one, it, it feels like it falls a little more on that. Um, a little more on the scandalous side. I, 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 yes. Um, I, I, and this is something I, I truthfully believe in. I, I believe in many are called, few are chosen. I believe in certain sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. And I believe we do go through periods as a church that where we could be a little under condemnation, but still have elements of truth. Does it, does it hit hard and hurt in some elements? Yes. I wish we would take some way more of this and invest. I live in an area, I've been in a bishopric that's not uh, a very wealthy area in Utah. And I've, I've seen us do a lot of good with the funds of the church and help personally. And I just think if we could expand that so much further, I just don't know there is so much more good to be done. And that, and I, I, I and that you guys might view that as naive or ignorant, but that's kind of where I stand on it. But I would also really like to see a lot of this cleaned up. 
and done better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm glad that you're watching the show and I didn't catch the name. I apologize. What was the name? Justin. Justin. Yeah. Thanks for watching oh, the show. Justin. Yeah. We're not here to, we're certainly here to be a voice of uh, a criticism, hopefully not cynicism about the church, trying to give it credit where credit is due. Cynicism. And I think we've done that already tonight. Uh, but I'm glad you're watching the show to answer your question. I think that the days of the shell companies with EP are gone because they got found out because of a whistleblower and then it got investigated. And then even though EP started in 1997, the first time EP filed a 13 F quarterly in its own name, representing its assets was not until the year 2000. 2020. Was it two? Th I'm sorry, 2020. I lost 20 years. 2020. Thank you. Um, so in other words, it wasn't 23 years until 23 years later that EP for the first time after its creation files a 13F that it was required to file from the very beginning because it had over $100 million in assets and $7 billion to start with is a lot more than $100 million. Okay, so those days are past. That particular strategy is gone. And EP, I expect, is going to be filing in its own name from here on out. But just because that particular strategy is gone, the fact that they used it in the first place and they used it for so long and they were so deceptive about it in doing it doesn't make me optimistic that the church won't come up with some other strategy or in the future or is engaged in at least one, if not more strategies that we don't know about right now. Can I ask I a question to Justin? To say, Go ahead. Oh. I Sorry. Bill made a comment earlier, but since he was muted, I don't think anyone heard it. Well, what did he say? Uh oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, am I there? No. Hold on yeah. A second, so, Justin. Bill. Yeah, Bill. I just saw. I don't know if you were talking to somebody else, or I thought you were. Making no, 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 no. I during... no, no, no. I was talking to Justin off the air from this, letting oh. him know that we were going to hang up with him and let him listen off the air. But Spence wants to ask him a question. And Good. Justin actually wants to ask us a question again as well. So go ahead, Spence. If you don't mind, uh, this is a question I've wanted to ask uh, faithful members a lot. So do you think it's possible that God directed the church to create these shell companies and report in this way? So in all honesty, you know way more about this than me. Okay. Um. I have wondered, and I don't know, but I have wondered there was such a, a long period of time between ill prophets and different things that President Hinckley and President Monson were very involved in all the interactions of the church for quite a long time. I wondered when, and I, and I feel their prophets, I love their teachings, I have felt the spirit when I listened to them. I wonder when President Nelson was put in and there was this huge change. I, I also wonder at that moment, were they aware of this situation because it was a pretty drastic change in leadership? As far as your question, Oh, I, I will say, I'll just throw in here. I'm sorry. Hey, Justin, no, hang, on. But, hang on a second. Yeah, I will please. just say to answer your question that yes, Gordon B. Hinckley in his first presidency totally knew about this because it was in 1997 that but this was started. created when yeah. Gordon B. Hinckley was the president and it continued under Thomas Monson's administration in, in, and continued under President Nelson's administration. So all of them knew about it together with all their counselors in the first presidency and the correspondence. Oh, no, but that, that's what I was wondering. I don't know if President Nelson knew about it. Of course, I believe the other ones knew about it. Yeah, Nelson yeah, he might knew be about it when he became president right. and he continued the policy even after the two yeah. guys, no. there was a whistleblowing no, and, and, and two I, of the investors I, quit. I, yeah. But I, and then as far as your other question, Yes, it, it doesn't smell well. It's not good. Um, just through our whole history, which I love to study and learn about, I've, I've never been one to fully believe that God directs 
every decision, every doctrine, and I think it's up to us to always wrestle back and forth on what the role of the prophet is, number one. And also, we always got to check ourselves in self-interest and pride and sin. Um, I, And I guess I could only say that as my own witness. I pray. I read the Book of Mormon. I feel the spirit in the seven sections and other sections. I'm like, I don't even know if that was translated correctly. Yeah, that's the Isaiah. Um, but, but what I say, I've had God talk to me every day, guiding every moment of my life. No. Yeah, Justin, can I ask you a question? Here's my question. It is de- uh-huh. de- demonstrable in the SEC order, the nine-page order, that the first presidency was complicit in breaking the laws, the federal laws of the United States over a period of 22 years in order to conceal how much money the church had from the members because they were concerned that the members would not pay tithing if they knew how much money they had. I understand what you've said, I believe. My question for you is, how many more laws or how big a law would the first presidency have to break before you would think that that would impact your testimony as to whether they're called of God to be prophets. Well, and, and that's a loaded gun question. I mean, if we're both really honest, there's you put some mustard on that. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, is it the thing we always fear? I mean, you think about the book Under the Banner of Heaven when people are like calling us the Taliban. That, that's hard to read something like that um oh, right but i think that's a different issue so here's my question because frequently and i used to be this way i mean i was tbm i had this huge massive spiritual experience the first time i prayed my way through the book of mormon when i was 18 years old justin so you know uh, we've got a lot in common but usually when i a lot of times when i ask this question to members of the church um you know what would the first presidency have to do in order for you to think, okay, that's too much. And the answer is almost always X plus one. In other words, no matter what they've done and no matter how bad it is and no matter how indisputable it is, like it is in this case, it's always something more than that, that they would have to do. And so I'm wondering, is there, if this isn't enough for you to think that Either these guys are not called of God, or if they were, they've blown it, and now they're not called of God anymore. And amen to the priesthood of that man, by the way, section 121, right? Amen to the priesthood of that man. Right. What would they have to do? But I I guess that's the thing, and this is from a believer's perspective. Yeah. That's why we want to hear your perspective. I would say that you could go through the history of the church through the lost book of Lehi all the way through every prophet that in that calling that they've had an experience that they had a, they overreached Mm -hmm. and they were allowed to overreach and God had to bring it back. Now, do we apologize and say, sorry, I wish we did more of that, mm-hmm. but I, I wish think we did you could go from. Oh. Huh? I said, you said, I wish no, we did it, more of that saying happened. we're sorry. I and I said, I wish we did any of that. No, but I wish we did more of that. Like I, because yeah, the church has I never said it's sorry about like anything. That's the only point I'm making. Just we've never said, I'm sorry. Yeah, never. No, they're not sorry about I anything. You saying. can't criticize them. Right. Well, that, that's up to individual. I mean, I, I don't want to feel like I'm just following in blind faith. I did it my brother done you? with the California. I'm I, sorry, Justin. Huh? And yet, aren't you following in blind faith? If I'm understanding what you said, every single prophet who's gone before has done things that they shouldn't have done. And therefore, the current prophets can do things they shouldn't have done. And there's no limit to the things that they can do that they shouldn't do that's going to make you think that's too far. Have I stated your position accurately? If not, please correct me. I I understand how you're saying that. Am I correct? But no, 
always the, the, there's always elements, and we always got to fix it. And that to I, me is wood tools. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you, Justin. No, I, what did you say there? There's always elements of what? No, there's always elements of humanity and progression. And okay, so wait, okay, you haven't you haven't you haven't argued with me yet. You haven't told me that there is something that the prophet could do that would be too far for you. And if there's nothing the prophet can do that would be too far for you, that sounds like blind faith to me. No, it's not that at all. Okay, it, so what could the prophet me, do that to would be too far? No, my point is, it's not like I'm looking to check one thing off a list. Just, just as I would say, I love being an American, but we have a grotesque history in civil, dis, I mean, pe treating people poorly. Does that now mean that I should not be an American anymore? There's I don't a think that's answering difference. my question. Yeah. Okay, and, and the fact that you're not answering my question, and the fact that you seem to be intentionally going to lengths to not answer my question, no, I, makes me I well, mean, hang on, yes, makes me conclude. Course, makes me conclude. Like, makes me conclude no, that there process, is that uh, you're agreeing I, with me that there is nothing the president of the church could do, no matter how wrong, that would make that would be too oh, much no, for you, not, and you'd say he's not a prophet anymore. Well. Number one, if you said we got to gather up arms and defend and start murdering people, of course that. Oh, that'd be too honest, far. If you asked me to walk back to the story, that would probably be too much for me. Okay, so the prophet could do something that would be too much for you to accept him as a prophet. And you've given the example of if he said to the members to gather up arms and do what? To go murder people? No, it, it's it's not the fact of me accepting him as a prophet. It's me saying to myself, I can't follow that anymore. Okay. The church is going to continue on without me. I'm a, a very small piece. No, you're a very important piece. You may be small, but you're important. You're critical to the church. You're a small cog in the wheel, but without the cogs, the wheels don't turn. So I just want you to know that. I think we may have more in common than not. I'm not sure. But it almost sounds to me like what you're saying is the, the prophet could get tell people, gather your arms. We're going to go kill these innocent people. And that would be too much for you. You would leave, but they would still be a prophet. No, I'm saying is a prophet anything without followers? I wouldn't follow at that point. But he would still be a prophet. If, I, if I'm saying are, are people called of God or not called of God or no, I mean, I, here's I the thing. Okay. Thing now you've officially in entered that. into scaryville for me because no, now I, you're I starting to sound exactly too. like, hang on a second. Did you watch under the banner of heaven? Did you read the book? Are you familiar with the Lafferty's? Because you're starting to sound exactly I, like I that. I read the book. I did. not watch the show. Do you know the Lafferty's and are you or were you a member of their group? Are you serious? It's a simple yes or no question. No, I'm not. Okay, well, be careful because from what I'm hearing, it sounds like you would fit in there just a little too comfortably. I'm sorry you feel that. I was just calling with the question to ask about the SEC. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Justin. Hey, Justin, Justin, here's the deal. This is all about exchanging ideas. I asked you some very pointed questions. It's my nature. It's, it's my profession, actually. And I'm glad that you called. I'm glad that you hung in there. I'm glad you're watching the show for whatever reason. I hope you will in the future. And all I was doing was expressing my opinion to you. And you were expressing your opinion to me. And I think that is always a good thing. Yeah. So thank no, you for and calling. I want you to thank know. you for watching. You yeah. Thank you. Have a great day, Justin. Have a good evening. Thanks. Wow. That was that was interesting. 
All right. Uh, we do have a third caller. Do you want to take it real quick? And I'll just, uh, I'll make sure that there's no more calls that can come in, but we do have. Who wants uh, to follow Justin? <laughs> Ryan. Okay, I will say nothing. I, okay. I'm saying nothing on this part. Yeah. Ryan, you are, you're on my friend. You're on Mormonism live. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, after that, I don't know how to follow that. Um, I, I will say RFM. Um, part of what I want to talk about is I have been having discussions lately with my family, especially my siblings. And I even asked that of my brother, if like, is there anything you could think of that the prophets could do and you wouldn't believe anymore? And he completely debated the question. I didn't push him, but, um, but in that, I, I, your question that you had when you asked, you know, even if the church were true back in the late nineties, yes. has things changed that isn't anymore? And that really dawned on me, like this conversation I've been having with my, my family, mm-hmm. it is really like, I'm, I'm explaining to them, this is what I believed in the church back, you know, through my mission through the late nineties. Um, now I've fallen away since, um, I consider myself a hostile apostate now. I'll probably say that. Um, but I'm talking to them like, this is what I absorbed from the church. This is the lessons I was taught about what to think of the prophets with what to think of how the church was run. And the rebuttals they're coming at me with, I'm like, this is not a, the same church. I'm like, were we really sitting in the pews next to each other? And it, it really does feel like this is a very different organization. And I really think that maybe that is something Nelson is really trying to do is he's saying, I am going to change this into something else because I think part, and I don't think it's like he's wanting to drastically shift it. I think it's a necessity of the times where we have things like the internet is extending the memory a lot further than it used to be. Um, you know, you, they can't keep saying, oh, this is, you know, the second coming is around the corner because suddenly they remember that like, wait, no, they've been saying that for the last, you know, 30, 40, 50, however many decades. And it's like, wait, it's not happening. So they're now having to shift to saying like, oh, no, we're just at the beginning and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I think the church to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter, Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the whole thing. And I think that's part of what's going on here is that they are twisting and shifting under the the new technology. They don't understand the new way things work that they no longer understand. Um, and they're freaking out. Um, and I think this is a sign of it. Um yeah, and I think they're yeah, I, I just want to say that yeah, I, I totally agree. Oh, but sorry. right, I think they're freaking out. I was just going to say yeah, technology is exposing all the stuff that they were able to keep hidden mm-hmm. a lot better under the old technology. Yeah. Otherwise, new technology. Oh, yeah. There's nothing to worry about with new technology. That's a benefit to mankind, unless it's exposing all the crap that you had hidden. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Oh, by the way, one other thing, Ryan. While I'm yeah. busy talking, when I said I wasn't mm-hmm. going to say anything on this last caller. Yeah, I'm going to let Bill and Spencer close out, but I want to, I want you to repeat after me. Okay. When you say, when you say Mm -hmm. I have fallen away from the church. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please don't ever say that again. Instead. Yeah. I, 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 as soon as it left my mouth, I was like, "Eh, I probably should have picked a better phrase, but no, this is, this is where we rehearse right here on Mormonism life. Say with me now, Mm -hmm. I have graduated from Mormonism. Can you say that? Oh, I have graduated from Mormonism. Oh, I, I could, I got a PhD on my own. Absolutely. I got a whole story. You graduated that. from Mormonism. Um, and you can say that with pride instead of, I've fallen away from the church. No, you have graduated yeah. from Mormonism and I congratulate you and I award you your diploma, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Because they kept failing me for years. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, my friend. Thanks, Ryan. Well, you guys really talked a whole lot to Ryan. I couldn't get. Uh, I, w- I wanted to talk more to Justin. I uh, I heard so many wood tools there. I, I thought in inside any system, he could have been in Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, you know the the church just down the street from me. And if he would, he, those answers would still work. Well, you know, I I think my minister's called of God, but you know he makes mistakes and. It's all wood tools. And once you realize the only thing in your tool bag is wood tools, then once you understand what wood tools and steel tools are, you realize you have nothing left. You don't even need the bag anymore. No, you can just go find a different trade.
Well, Papa's got a brand new bag and it's full of steel tools. Yeah, you need them. Spence? That was good. I like Justin's uh, Justin's call. I'm sorry about Ryan. I just I was my head was still in Justin's call, but I know coming. It made to me think that he you. could have easily, with faith, you can. Right, we've all been Justin, right, Anthony? So like, I've been there. Yeah, with probably. faith, I could have argued with the same faith that either God directed the prophets to break the law, which is fine because God commanded it, just like Laban, just like. Abraham and Isaac, whatever, it's justified. Or I could also believe that God directed, this is going to sound weird, but directed David Nielsen to help the church and to correct the prophets. Yeah. And either way, the church is true. All signs have to point to the way the church is true using faith. And so this, I would go through this reasoning all the time. And I'd love to know if that's what people are doing, faithful members, or if they're or if they're seeing, leaning towards one explanation, which would be that the prophets did something wrong here. I know I held Justin's feet to the fire pretty severely, um, though I hope courteously and respectfully. But I got to think there's a reason he's watching in the first place. And the reason he's watching may be different than the way he presented in response to my questions, just saying yeah. it's a possibility. In to Spence's comment, the idea that... Um, Maybe David Nielsen was called of God to call these, to hold these men accountable would make a lot of sense if the handbook were to tell us that somebody committing this kind of financial fraud did require repentance and uh, accountability and a disciplinary council, for instance. First presidency needs to be disfellowshipped at a minimum. No yeah. sacrament. Yeah. For two weeks. <laughs> for two weeks. <laughs> no sacrament. Okay. okay. Anything else, you guys? I think I'm done. I have yeah, spoken right. my piece and then more so. Spencer, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are wunderbar. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope there are no more financial issues with the church going forward. There won't be. Of I'm exhausted. Not. How could you, there be? At least you won't be notified of them. That's All good. there are That's are good. secrets that the church is keeping that haven't been revealed yet. Confident, <laughs> c confidential things are. I'm sorry. Bad.